I'm 25 years old now, and I still remember this event pretty distinctly. At the time of when this event occurred, I was living in Aurora, Ohio, near Cleveland. I had one younger brother who wasn't present for some reason. The time of which this event occurred was probably either after school or during the middle of the day on a weekend. I don't remember. I do, however, remember that it was in broad daylight. My brother and I shared a room with a bunk bed in which the bottom bunk was perpendicular to the top bunk allowing for a sort of cubby of space underneath the top bunk. There was a small area of space, I'd say, probably about a foot in width between the back and the lower bed, and the wall it was near. My friend from class and I were sitting at the foot of the lower bed, at the opposite end, away from the underneath portion of the bunk bed, near the wall. We were playing with Pokemon cards. This was in like 2001 or 2002, so Pokemon was all the rage at this point for young kids. This was around the time period that Game Boy advancements were released. Everything was normal, and we were having a conversation as we were messing around with the cards. Then all of a sudden, something at the back of the bed caught the corner of my eye. Naturally, I turned to look to see what it was. As I looked to my left, the seemingly normal conversation I was having with my friend abruptly and ominously came to a halt, and both of us stared in bewilderment in complete silence for, I'd say, a good three seconds. It was very quick. When I turned, I saw a green hand which had come up from the back space behind the bed and was feeling the pillow and the bed in the area where my brother would put his head to sleep. Like I said, the whole thing lasted maybe about three seconds and then the hand vanished. I don't remember if it went back behind the bed or if it just dissipated. It happened very quickly. As soon as the hand disappeared, I broke the ominous silence and asked my friend sitting next to me, Did you see that? He replied, The hand, confirming that we both saw the same phenomenon. I ran across the house and told my mother what we had just seen, and she quickly brushed it off and told me it was nothing. I went back to the same room and continued playing with my friend. I wouldn't say that my friend and I were particularly scared by the event, though it was definitely very strange. I never told my little brother about it, who slept in the lower bunk bed. To this day, I remember this event distinctly, and I've looked online and have found other events that were similar to this event described on the internet. Other people claim to have seen hands in their house. Has anyone else heard of this before? This is an experience that happened with my friend, who was sleeping over at my house. We had a finished basement that we dubbed the second living room. It was our hangout with an old couch, chair, and all of our gaming consoles. My friend slept in the basement when she spent the night. I was in my room upstairs, and always told her she was more than welcome to sleep in my room, or at least the actual living room. She always declined because of how it got upstairs. She told me that she was laying down on the couch, having a hard time falling asleep. She was on her side with her back out to the room. She was feeling okay for a bit, but suddenly felt like someone was in the room with her. She turned around to see if it was me or my sister, but didn't see anything. She turned back around and just kind of laid there for a bit longer. Suddenly, she heard a man's voice start talking. She flipped around and saw a figure sitting on the chair on the other side of the room. She stares at it for a second, trying to get a good look at it. She realises that it doesn't really have any features. It's just the shape of a person sitting in the chair. Soon, it actually speaks to her. According to her, it asks how she was doing. She answers that she's doing fine and asks how he's doing. Typical southern girl. They carry on a conversation full of your typical small talk. Towards the end of the conversation... The figure asks, did I frighten you? She answered honestly and told her that she was startled because he kind of popped out of nowhere. He stood up and moved towards the stairwell and said, good, before walking up the stairs. At this point, she loses it. She calls me and yells that I need to get down there ASAP. I'm thinking she hurt herself or something, so I was down there in about 30 seconds. She's crying and tells me that someone was in the basement with her. I thought she meant someone had broken in through the one window that was there. We laid on a hill, 
and that one wall was above ground. I look at the window and see it's perfectly fine. I start to ask her what she means by that and she tells me about the figure and talking to it. I asked her why she made me come downstairs instead of coming up and she said she was paralysed after hearing it say good. She was so scared by this. She wouldn't even go upstairs until I brought down our dog to walk her back up. This is the same dog in my doorknob story and her thought process was he would protect her. Parker was more than happy to come down so she took that to mean it was safe to go. She decides she wants to sleep on my floor and have Parker there just in case. After that, she didn't sleep over again. Can't really blame her for that. This experience is one I share with my sister. The beginnings of it are a bit hazy, I'll admit. For whatever reason, I was sleeping in my sister's room. I think we may have watched a scary movie and I was too chicken to sleep in my own room. Needless to say, I don't remember why I was in there, but that's where the story took place. We're sitting on her bed around 1am. We had a dog that slept in my sister's room at the time, so he was there too. Parker, the dog, had fallen asleep, so we were trying not to wake him up. He's loud when he's rowdy. So we're just playing on our phones, showing each other videos, cracking jokes, the usual. We had to be quiet because both parents were in bed and it was a weeknight. I think we were on some school break. I'm not 100% sure though. After a while of nothing interesting happening, Parker shoots his head up. My sister and I are both caught off guard. We stop what we're doing and listen to see what woke him up. We don't hear anything in the hall and turn our attention back to our phones. Parker is still staring at the door a few minutes after we stop paying attention. My sister tries to get his attention so he would lay back down and go to sleep. She has no luck getting Parker to even acknowledge that she's there, let alone responding to his name or pets. After a few more minutes of him staring the door down and my sister trying to get his attention, something happens. The doorknob was a bit loose in the door. Years of kids grabbing and pulling will do that to a doorknob. It looked and sounded like someone was on the other side of the door, wiggling the knob up and down extremely fast. Parker hears and sees this and goes nuts. He jumps off the bed, gets between the door and the bed. We're still sitting on it at this point, and it's just snapping and snarling in a way that we've never ever heard from him before. It was honestly terrifying. My sister and I were completely frozen. We didn't know what to do. Parker was showing all the signs of a dog in full-on aggression mode. His ears were back, his hackles were raised, and it looked like he was trembling. I thought at the time that maybe he was so angry, he was shaking, but looking back, I honestly think he was trembling out of fear. Of course, because it was 1am on a weeknight, it took my parents about three seconds to get out of bed and come storming into the room. My dad throws open the door and starts yelling at everyone. He thought we got Parker startled. He soon realises that my sister and I are crying, and Parker peacefully lay down on the floor and was watching my dad. My mom comes in and asks me why, why we got Parker startled, and why we were crying so hard. We told her that we didn't do anything. Parker heard the doorknob being wiggled around and jumped up and went nuts. Of course, my dad is a typical non-believer, and said that we must have had a dream and scared Parker when we woke up. We knew there was no point in arguing with him, because he never believed us when he told him of this weird shit in our house. My mum was a bit more reassuring and laid with us for the rest of the night. Nothing else happened after my parents came into the room. Growing up in my childhood home, my friends and I spent a lot of time in the ditch between my neighbour's house and mine. We'd also do a whole bunch of things like crawling through the drainage pipes, only when sunny of course, playing in the ditch while it rained, it was super fun when the water built up, and other forms of tomfoolery. One day, I was hanging out in the ditch with a couple of my friends when we heard this whistling. We all went quiet for a moment and listened very hard. It was getting closer and closer while we all looked around, panicked, trying to figure out if someone was messing with us. We all got out of the ditch looking around everywhere and didn't see anyone. Soon, it sounds like the whistling was coming from behind us and we booked it to my house. 
We all took a few minutes to settle down and were still looking around to see if it was someone's older sibler being a jerk. But we never saw anyone. We all discussed how scared we were and how it felt like the hairs on the back of our necks stood up, the closer the whistling got. We never saw anything and we never heard the approach of anyone that might have been whistling. Once, my mum and I were taking a walk around our neighbourhood to get out the house for a little bit. We were a couple of streets away from our streets and walking next to the local park. It was midsummer in the middle of Georgia, so the temperature was about 95 degrees. We were just chatting about different things when both of us got silent as we walked through an ice cold spot. It was two seconds at the most, but the change in temperature was very jarring. We got through the spots and walk in silence a bit further down the road. I broke the silence first and asked her if she felt the icy spot back there. She looked at me and nodded her head and said she also felt like we were being watched and weren't supposed to go through the spot. The mood had drastically changed and we decided to end the walk early and go home. Lastly, a bunch of friends and I were at a neighbourhood park and we are typical obnoxious middle school teenagers. We were sitting around the picnic table area and were laughing and joking. My younger sisters was there and I happened to be best friends with someone with the same name. We're all laughing and joking together when suddenly a few of us hear something calling my sisters and friends name. We weren't sure who it was directed at so I put both to be safe. Those of us who heard it the first time quickly told the others to be quiet and listen. We heard it again and more clearly because everyone was quiet now. It was very unsettling the way the name was said. None of us could tell the gender of the voice or pinpoint where exactly it was coming from. It kept saying the name over and over, getting more drawn out each time it was said. There were a few other kids and parents at the park in the play area, so we figured it was one of them calling their kid. However, we were all watching them and they were on the other side of the park, which means they would have had to be yelling for us to hear them. This voice that said the name was not yelling. After that, we decided to go our separate ways and go home for the night. We didn't go back to the park for a while. I was around 12 years old and sitting on the back of my dad's truck with a tailgate down. I was waiting for my friend to meet up with me so we could do whatever 12 year olds do on a weekend. It was a spring day in Georgia, so everything was alive and very noisy. Dogs were barking, birds were chirping, and bugs were screaming. After sitting there for a while, everything goes silent. There wasn't a peep. I looked around to see if there were any birds or dogs around me. There wasn't. When I turned to look at the street, there was a black, misty, shapeless form walking from my neighbours across the street from me to their neighbour's yard. As I'm watching it move, I whisper in disbelief, what the hell is that? Apparently it heard me because it stopped as soon as I said it and looked like it was turning towards me. Although it was shapeless, it was thinner while moving and kind of thickened out like a normal person would when you look at them head on. It stood there for what felt like an eternity and, I'm guessing, stared me down. My heart was beating very fast and I don't think I was breathing. It started to move towards me and was about to step into the street when I heard my friend yell to me from up the street. The way the houses were built, she couldn't see the side of the street with the form. I snapped my head to her, raised my hand so she knows I'm there and immediately go back to look for the form. It wasn't there anymore. Once I saw that it was gone, everything came back to life. All the noise expected at springtime hit me at once and I became extremely overwhelmed and started to cry. My friend reached me and saw that I was crying. She was rightfully confused and asked why I was upset. I told her everything that I experienced and she got quiet. She told me she saw it not too long before I did at her house and told me that she was terrified during the encounter. She said it started to move towards her from the neighbor's yard, like me, into hers and she was completely frozen. She broke out of that trance because her mom told her she needed to come inside for dinner. Because we were so spooked by that, we decided it was a good day to have a movie marathon. I never saw it again, 
But I do believe I had other encounters with it. So, was it a ghost? Or was it a demon? In Meriden, Connecticut, about 40 minutes outside of where I live, there exists a range of mountainous trap rock ridges called Hanging Hills. The easiest way to get to them is to park in a wooded mountainous park called Hubbard Park and take a trail that starts with a slightly intimidating passenger bridge that crosses over the highway. I'm afraid of heights, but always try to challenge myself by going hiking and putting myself in slightly uncomfortable situations to overcome my fears. In the spring of 2014, my wife, girlfriend at the time, and I decided to take our umpteenth hike up Hanging Hills to see Castle Craig, a stone tower that stood at the end of the main trail and overlooked the cliffs, the city of Meriden and Quinnipiac Valley. For the umpteenth time, we launched into a discussion on the drive there about the legend of the black dog. I find ghost stories that have any shred of historical reality to them intriguing, because most representations of ghosts on TV or YouTube these days involve people becoming easily scared by shaking or noises in an abandoned location. The Legend of the Black Dog is an exception because it involves the legend itself and a story of two geologists from the late 1800s encountering it and actually documenting it. The legend has it that you see the Black Dog of Hanging Hills once for joy, twice for sorrow, and three times for death. There are plenty of legends of black dogs in folklore that tell a similar tale. The two geologists, W.H.C. Pynchon and Herbert Marshall, were conducting research of the area in the winter of 1891, when they encountered the black dog. According to the story, Pynchon had seen it once and Herbert twice before. Herbert didn't believe in the legend. After ascending the hills again alone, Herbert supposedly fell to his death. I remembered the image of the black dog from the WHC Pynchon story was very clear every time we hike up the mountain. This time was no different. That particular day, my girlfriend and I encountered a hiker on the trail that was letting his black dog without a collar roam loose. We weren't sure whether it was to mess with people or not. The dog wasn't little like the one depicted in Pynchon's story. Rather, it was a bigger like a lab terrier mix and friendly too. It came up to us and started panting at our legs. Sorry about that, the hiker said, as he caught up to the dog and us. Not at all. I bet you love having a little legend with you around here. Oh yeah, the ghost dog, the hiker said, forcing a laugh and grimacing, as if he'd heard that one too many times before. As he walked away, my girlfriend made a comment about my obsession with the stupid dog and not wanting to hear about it. We made our way to Castle Craig about 20 minutes later. Unlike the trails off the highway, the main trail from the park is not long or difficult, other than a large hill at the end of it. We took pictures on top of the tower and by the cliffside, not really thinking anymore about the black dog. We had made so many trips up to the tower and seen so many hikers with black dogs, that the legend almost seemed like a joke at that point. Want to take the main trail down or the road? I asked, as we finished up taking pictures and drinking whatever water and Gatorade we had left in our packs. The road, she insisted. We can see that river. The road leading up to Castle Craig is typically taken by cars and bikers. We sometimes hike down it to catch a glimpse of the Quinnipiac River on the way back to the park. Despite it being a warm April day, there were very few cars and bikers on the way down. It was nice and quiet. About a quarter of a mile into our walk, my girlfriend tugged me on the shoulder and pointed to a figure on the side of the road between some shrubbery. It stood about ten feet ahead of us. What the hell is that? she said. I took a step forward but she tugged on my shirt and shook her head. Is that what I... I nodded. All I could do was nod. The figure was small and resembled a black dog with floppy ears and a hot dog tail, much like the one in Pynchon's illustration. I wouldn't have thought much of it if not for the fact the figure was blurry. It wasn't the distance between us that made it blurry and there weren't any fog related conditions that day. It was almost as if mother nature had taken the dog in a photoshop program and used the blur effect on it. Even when I took a step closer 
To my girlfriend's hesitance, it still looked blurry. We were frozen, otherwise though, and didn't think to take a picture of the figure. There was an unknowing understanding between us that we shouldn't approach and just wait for it to cross. As the figure crossed the road, it didn't look at us. It just dawdled with its nose to the ground. For the rest of the hike, we were silent. We both knew what we saw, but couldn't put it into words. It was only after a while that I said I should have taken a picture, but deep down, I felt it was a good thing that I didn't. Seeing the figure wasn't frightening, but it wasn't particularly pleasant either. We've been back to Hanging Hills many times since. We never encountered any luck or sorrow, just a memory of a little blurry back dog, and an understanding that when you see an actual paranormal entity with someone else and understand what it is, there isn't really a question about it. I've read many stories posted online since about the black dog. Few have described what we saw though. Black dogs run loose in the park all the time, and a number of the encounters we read about seem like fabrications or just encounters with stray dogs. For most of my life, my grandparents lived in a small town on the border of Maine and New Hampshire. To even get to the house, you had to travel through several back roads that were not lit by any streetlights. They built the house from the ground up in the early 90s with the help of family members and a small construction crew. It was an idealistic brick and wood style house with three bedrooms, a half finished basement and a porch that was sealed off from the rest of the house. Growing up, my brother and I used to spend at least one week of summer alone at the house. My grandparents weren't the warm type, but they would take us hiking, bring us to the beach, and let us roam the property on our own. My grandparents' house had what seemed like endless woods surrounding it, and miles of tall grass that separated their property from their neighbor's house. When my brother was 11 and I was 8, we went exploring one afternoon in an attempt to find that neighbor's house. My grandparents were off gardening and didn't care so much about what we went, as long as we were home for dinner. That's the way it was with the seven boys they raised, and they didn't feel it would be any different with their grandkids. As we made our way through the tall grass, we cut ourselves on the blades, and I was bit by a garter snake. We were unfazed though, because unless we're seriously injured, my grandparents paid no mind and had the boys will be boys attitude. With the grass so tall, it was tough to know how far we were from either house. Eventually, we stumped upon a patch of dead grass and a peach tree. It seemed odd to find a peach tree in the middle of nowhere, but we were excited and started picking peaches off the tree. We sat atop the branches, burying our faces in the juiciest peaches that tasted nothing like what our mom bought us from the grocery store. After a few minutes, we saw a figure standing under the tree. It was an African-American woman in a rose pink embroidered dress. She looked middle-aged and tired. A moment later, we noticed a young boy and girl about our age standing behind her. The boy was wearing overalls and a white t-shirt, and the girl was wearing a sundress. Their outfits looked unusual, but we didn't question them. We just stared, though, as the woman smiled. Go ahead and eat the peaches, she said, smiling. We just stared blankly at her. It's okay. We smiled, said thanks, and grabbed a few peaches to take with us. You two look tired. Where do you live? We're at our grandparents' house over there. She nodded, but never told us where they lived. My brother had spotted another snake in the grass and darted after it. The two kids laughed and watched as he wrangled the snake and slung it across his shoulder as if he was Indiana Jones. I tried to catch another nearby snake, but fell flat on my face. By the time I got up from the ground, the woman and her children were gone. When we went back to my grandparents' house, we told them about finding the peach tree and coming across her neighbor and kids. She was only half paying attention though and made some sort of comment about how it was nice kids still played outside. About 20 years later, when my grandparents had sold the house and moved to a mobile home in New Hampshire, I asked her if she remembered her African-American neighbours that lived next door. This gave her pause as she struggled to remember. There was a French woman who lived there, she told me, but not African-American. Maybe she had friends over. 
No, she said, confused. She lived alone, and hardly anyone visited her. I started to think that I had dreamt of the events because it happened so long ago. When I recently asked my brother, he thought it was interesting that I never brought it up after all this time. He had thought he might have dreamt it too. He remembered the family and remembered the peach tree, but a couple of summers later when he went up to my grandparents' house alone, he tried to retrace our steps but couldn't find any peach tree. He only saw the old French woman that lived there for many years. For years, I've struggled to think of a logical explanation for that event. I even tried best to research the property we had searched for. Turns out, like my grandparents, the French woman had her house built on the property. Before then, the property had just been woods and one long flowing field of tall grass. I also discovered that peach trees do grow in Maine, and the type of clothing I remembered the woman and her children wearing were most popular in the 1930s. There were no records of the property before the 1960s though, when the French woman had her house built. Growing up, I absolutely hated being home. At night, it always sounded like someone was walking around, and there were whispers from my closet whenever it was left open. I always made sure it was closed, but most mornings it would be partially open. I would refuse to go into the basement even during the day, as you could never escape the feeling of someone or something watching you. I'm talking full-on blankets over the head, nose poking out type of childhood. One night in the summer, we had a powerful thunderstorm roll through. I remember it vividly because the lightning was near constant, and instead of white and blue, the colours were more purple and green. The storm took out the power. My father asked me to go to the kitchen and help get the candles and flashlights. I was walking down the dark hallway when something jumped out from the bathroom. The kitchen door was five feet behind it. Thinking it was my dad trying to scare me, I laughed and said, nice try. There was a loud growl, and my father put his hand on my shoulder from behind me. He pulled me back into the living room, closed and locked the door, while saying that it wasn't him, and he saw it too. The growling continued from the kitchen entryway for a good ten minutes, and it sounded like something was pacing the hallway. Then I, Dad and I spent the night in the living room. We didn't sleep. We just watched the door. We moved a few months later. The house we moved to felt good. I had no issues with feeling watched or hearing things. Felt like I could sleep without the blankets over my head. Years later, when my father was diagnosed with cancer, we started watching ghost shows on cable. They got us talking about that night and what we saw. It was then my father revealed that the house I grew up in was an old, renovated funeral home. The way the house was renovated, my closet was the mechanical room for the lift to bring the bodies from the basement embalming room to the viewing room on the first floor. Our floor was the funeral director's private living space. My father's aunt actually owned the house and lived on the first floor, which was the floor where they would have the viewings and such. The house has changed hands to cousins of mine. Talking with them, they said they had similar experiences. Scratching on the wall, footsteps, banging on the basement bulkhead, and lights that would come on dimly as if they were connected in series, rather than each light being its own circuit. They even told me they won't go into the basement alone, because the stairs go past the walk-in storage room with no lights, and they swore they heard breathing and or growling when they went past. They have since moved from that house also. We lived there for 13 years, 1977 to 1990. It wasn't until after the incident during the storm in 1990 that my father decided it was time to move. I made a note of every experience we had, individually and as a family, in a journal. I'll go room by room. I should note that I wasn't allowed in my parents' room for obvious reasons, and I was able to debunk the noises once my teenage years set in. Parents had a healthy relationship. Every room in common. Cold spots, old smells were common throughout the house. 
We attributed that to the old steam radiator heaters. Scratching on walls at night, no rats or vermin, no insect activity or plumbing issues. Dad was a maintenance foreman. He checked everything out. Also of note, there were no trees close enough to the house. You always felt like you were being watched. None of my friends ever stayed over or wanted to come inside the house. They always said the house creeped them out. Now onto the experiences by specific room. Entryway A. The interior door of the entryway was wood with glass panes. This opened to a stairwell that leads down to the main floor. The entryway door was always locked at night. The door had an old hook and latch style door closure with a thumbs button to operate it. It was very secure, but on many occasions my father would find the door slightly open or completely open when he got up. Sometimes it was so early enough in the night you could hear the click from the hatch. The hallway runner would always be bunched up, even though the door cleared it easily. Bathroom F. This is the room where the thing jumped out of the hallway during the storm. You never entered the bathroom in the dark. Almost the entire back of the door was covered by a mirror. Anyone closing the bathroom door always covered the mirror because it never felt right. You could see shadows move in the reflection, but not when you turned to see behind you. We couldn't take the mirror down as it had been basically painted into place. The thought of busting the mirror always made you feel nauseous and sick. The kitchen. Gee. Cabinets would open and close. The bell for the toaster would ding at odd times, even if the toaster was off or unplugged. Dining room E. The main light over the table would turn on dimly red at odd times. The bulb was a bright white incandescent. At night, you could hear the old push button switch get pushed because the click was so loud. Pantry H. The room always see sleeved me out. The room was like a walk-in closet for dry goods and the like. As soon as you entered, you felt like bugs were crawling all over you. But there was never a bug in sight. No spiders, nothing. Also, you made your selection quickly because you always felt like something was going to drop on you from above. Very unsettling. Sun porch slash sunroom, I. For Christmas one year, my father got me a Fonzie pinball machine. It was kept unplugged when not in use. On a few occasions, you could hear the chuk chung of the flippers or the sound of a ball rolling down the game field. Dad thought the game was malfunctioning, but it wasn't. There was also an electronic bowling lane. The ball would roll around the room at night sometimes, and the game played music if you got a strike. The music would sound at odd times and off speed. This is also where the attic access was. Attic J. Now the cool thing about the attic was that the former funeral director had a full bar and billiard table in the attic, along with a spare guest room. How we got that stuff up there is a mystery, because the attic entryway was super narrow. Oddly, the attic was calm. I remember a wood carving just past the door that depicted Ireland, and etched into the wood was a Gaelic message. When we moved, we took the wood carving with us, with permission. I'm only the third generation in the family who wasn't born in Ireland. My dad hung out on the front door of our new house. My grandfather could read Gaelic and translated the meaning and it roughly translated, Ireland protects those that cross this threshold. I had some issues as a child. I'm not afraid to admit that now. My parents did the right thing and took me for professional help. One of the recommendations of the psychiatrist was to keep a journal, and I did. Faithfully. Now initially it had things I was experiencing, like difficulty relating to kids at school. Bullying, self-doubt of my abilities, things of that nature. In April of 96, my psychiatrist wanted me to focus on things that frightened me, or made me feel uncomfortable. This was what he thought was a significant problem, and now, I agree it was. In the end, it really helped me find my way in life and face my fears head on, and I attribute my success to these sessions. 
Never be afraid to get help. There are many people who have experienced similar things. You're not alone. I have to admit, going back and reading this journal, which I kept along with class photos and yearbooks, my spelling and grammar have improved considerably, and there were lots of things I forgot about. First entry about my house. April 1986. My bedroom and closet. It's morning, and I couldn't be happier. Last night was scary. I woke up and it was still very dark. I heard scratching from my closet, so I got up and turned on my room light to make sure my hamster didn't escape. She didn't, she's still in her cage. I checked the closet and it was closed. Turned off the light and went back to bed. I tried to go back to sleep, but I kept hearing sounds. It sounded like my closet latch. I think it was being lifted up. I heard it click. After the latch clicked, it felt like something was in the room with me. It felt like I was being watched. I covered my head with my blankets. I heard something moving in my room. My hamster was quiet. She wasn't running in her wheel tonight or biting her water dispenser. I thought something might have harmed her, but she seemed okay. I hoped my mum or dad would be checking my window, but it's not summer and the windows are closed. The sound was in my room and moving around. It was near my toy box, not my window. My toy box is at the foot of my bed. I heard a G.I. Joe fall over. I'm not alone. My dad woke up and got ready for work. That means it was four. He always farts or sneezes first thing. That's how I know it's him in the hallway. I'm alone in my room now. I was able to sleep once I heard dad moving in the house. I told my dad when he got home from work what happened in the night and morning. Dad opened my closet to show me it was just stuff. It was very cold in the closet. He thinks I might have dreamed it. Mom does too. Could I have? No. My closet door was not latched and slightly open this morning. Even now with the sun up and as I'm writing this, something is watching me from the closet. I know I closed it before bedtime. There's also a rip in my Transformers sleeping bag at my feet. Second entry about my house. May 1986, early evening. I helped my dad cut the grass today. After that, we had to put away the tools and equipment. Unfortunately, these have to go back into the basement. I really hate the basement. It doesn't feel right, which means I get goosebumps. It smelled stuffy and heavy, like moss and very old pennies. I was helping to put away the grass catcher when dad asked me if I saw something move along the tool wall. I think he was trying to tease me because I was really jumpy about being so far into the basement. What I didn't want to tell him was that I did see something move along that wall. It moved to the corner, then it moved up the wall and then it was gone. The worst part of the basement was the storage area by the stairs. It's really dark and there's no light to turn on. I won't go in there, ever. I won't even shine a light in that room because I have nightmares about that creepy room sometimes and in them, the floor is bloodstained. I also believe that whatever has been up to my closet at night comes up from this storage room of the basement. I stay as far away from the opening as possible because also in my nightmares, there's something in there that will pull me in if I get too close. We finish putting all the tools away and dad always has, to, has me go before him because the old wooden stairs are loose. We make it out of the basement and my dad padlocks the door. We share a key with my aunt Jay and uncle Jay. We usually run into uncle Jay after cutting the grass. He's a nice guy and likes to make models. He always warned me about going into the basement alone. I always took him seriously. Dad would say that Uncle Jay was just trying to spook me. Late evening. Mom asked me to help make the casserole and asked me to get the mac and cheese and the soup from the pantry. I don't like the pantry either. It reminds me too much of my closet. I really want the casserole, so I went into the pantry and tried to pull the light cord, but I couldn't find it. I think something touched my hand and I jumped back quickly and I closed the pantry door. 
I'm trying to calm down when my mum says it's just my imagination. I tried again and found the light cord. The light goes on and I gather the stuff. I think it's odd that I can smell the basement in the pantry. And just then, along the back of the pantry wall, I see a large grey pile of what I think are worms, wiggling like the night crawlers I help dad get for fishing. I drop the stuff to the floor and step back. My mother comes over and I point, and my mother must have seen it too, because she let out a gasp and chucked the soup can at it. She then closed the door and called for my dad. Mom said she thinks she saw a squirrel of something in the pantry. Dad had a look, no squirrel, also no hole in the wall, no nothing. I helped my mom make the casserole. We both kept an eye on the pantry door while cooking. Mom told me that maybe we have imaginary issues. Late evening. As I'm writing this, I'm in my bedroom, burping casserole. I'm a bit worried about tonight, as I was in the basement today and it likely saw me. I know what that means for tonight. The next morning. I woke up and it was morning. I guess helping dad cut the lawn and that must have helped me sleep through the night. I hear my parents talking in the kitchen. Mom was asking dad if he could figure out why all the kitchen cabinets were wide open. I heard them talking about maybe the house settling or maybe I didn't close them tight after helping with dinner cleanup. All the close them tight part. I looked over at my closet, which was again partially open, and the hairs on my arms stood up. I jumped at the sound of three knocks on my bedroom door. I looked over, expecting to see one or both of my parents, but no one was there. I then heard three knocks from the closet door and I bolted from my bed, kicked the closet door closed and I went right to my parents, knowing I couldn't explain that I made sure the cabinets and my closet, for that matter, were closed. Third entry about my house. June 1986, afternoon. My parents got me the D&D red box. I'm really excited because I got a chance to play in a summer camp last year and it was really fun. My therapist said I needed something to focus my imagination on and to give me an outlet. I'm not sure why I need a wall plug, but he's a doctor. My cousin, three years younger than me, is coming over today for the weekend. I'll let him know about what goes on at night here. No one seems to believe me when I tell them the things that I've seen, except my Uncle Jay. Evening. My room. My cousin will be here until Sunday. We spent a bunch of time reading the D&D rule books. My cousin wanted to tell scary stories. I told him if we're unlucky, we'll be in one. And I explained what I had been seeing lately. He laughed it off, but requested we use a nightlight. Night. My room. My parents had gone to bed, and my cousin and I had just finished going over the rule books, colouring in the dice numbers, and trying to make our first characters. We lost track of time, and soon discovered that we were almost 1.15 in the morning. We decided it was time to turn in. I checked the closet, and it was closed and latched. We had sleeping bags, Transformers for me, Spider-Man for the cuz, on the floor. We continued to goof off a bit, when the room got very cold, like a window opened. Just as my cousin went, we both heard a loud click. We both peered over the top of the bed and saw the closet was no longer closed completely. We also noticed the nightlight was getting dimmer, and the room darker. Suddenly, the room went pitch black as the nightlight went completely out. There were two large windows in my room, but there wasn't even any moonlight coming in. When the nightlight came back on the closets was more open, and we both saw something dark in the corner near a window. The nightlight went out again. The room got dark except for the moonlight coming in the window this time. The moonlight was broken by what looked like a set of three-fingered hands reaching into it. Grabbing our sleeping bags, we ran to the living room, clicked on all the lights, and, and camped as close as we could to my parents' room. My hamster's cage was moved to the dining room because I told my parents that maybe that was the noise I could hear at night and that's what was waking me up. She had been in her exercise wheel 
when my cousin and I ran from my room. I remember hearing the sound of her running the tube to get to her nest area. Then the house was silent. Silent until my dad tripped over my cousin. He was about to chew us out for making so noise so late or early, but a door slammed in my room and he went to check it out. We camped out in the living room. When my dad came back, he said he'll fix the closet latch and that we shouldn't be reading monster books so late at night, sliding the red box to me. Oddly enough, he said we will spend the rest of the weekend at my grandmother's house. My cousin vowed to never spend the night at my house again. Entryway, dad brought me home after spending the weekend with my grandparents. It was honestly the best night's sleep I've had in a long time. Quiet, calm, and smelled like grandma's cooking. As we got closer to home, just seeing it, I feel sick to my stomach. On entering, I actually stopped and dropped the overnight bag. The house felt different. Before I left with my cousin, it felt spooky and frightening. But now, the only thing I can feel is just seething anger. Fourth entry about my house. July 1987. General observation. I'm out of therapy, no more journal. I'm feeling better about myself and more self-confident. Meeting weekly in school for a D&D club transferred to meeting as a group of friends during summer vacation to play. I can honestly admit that I'm finally feeling more like a kid. Or should I say teenager? As even I have noticed I'm becoming a bit more observant of girls. At least when I'm outside of the house. It's now late July and summer. Long, hot nights of little sleep. Everyone was always upset and angry at home. We need a few days of rain to cool the house and tempers down or something was going to give. Night. My room. It's hot and sticky and none of the fans are helping. My dad was working on fixing the AC for the living room, but he retired for the night after watching the 11 o'clock news. Our neighbours are outside. I can hear them talking and smell whatever they're cooking. I'm just waiting for exhaustion to take me. Early morning, my room. Something hit me in the night. It felt like a punch and I awoke with my face and chest hurting. My glow-in-the-dark alarm clock showed me it was 3.07am. I got out of bed and flipped my room light on. My eyes immediately locked to the closet and to my surprise... It was latched and closed. I noticed that my hands have blood on them, and there's blood on my chest. I headed for the bathroom. Night, approximately 3.15am, bathroom. Light on, I close the door and look at the damage in the medicine cabinet mirror. Split lip, dark mark around the side of my mouth. The busted lip where the, where the blood came from. There are three marks on my chest as big as a quarter. They hurt. I'm sure they'll be bruised by tomorrow afternoon, as will my face. For some reason, I got angry at my reflection. It felt like every bad thought or negative feeling I've had about myself came back ten times over, and all at once. In disgust with seeing myself and how I was feeling, I open the cabinet so I don't have to see my reflection. The cabinet mirror is now facing the mirror behind the door. I start to notice small movement in the reflections of the mirrors in the door mirror. I caused an infinity reflection due to the mirrors reflecting each other. This meant there were multiple reflections of me. Now at my limit, I angrily tossed a towel that happened to land on the robe hook. The towel covered the mirror and I could feel the pressure in the room subside considerably. I gathered myself, went through a few of the coping techniques I learned, and finished cleaning myself up and then exited the bathroom. For some reason, before turning the light to the bathroom off, I looked to the kitchen. The door leading to the sunroom and the back stairs was fully open. I shut the bathroom lights out, but there was still a glow from the rooms across from me. Dining room. The lights over the table are on, but not on. They're glowing dimly, even though we don't have dimmers in the house. I'm still angry from the feeling in the bathroom, and I couldn't stop myself from saying what was on my mind. Go to hell. The lights faded out, but I felt still. Suddenly my father's there and I'm about to jump out of my skin. 
He asked me what I was doing up. He flipped the light on and saw me. Thinking that I may have been harming myself, he's checking out the marks and swollen lip. He's being loud when asking me what I did, loud enough to wake my mother. The angry feeling the room flooded again, and the lights once again glowed dim. My dad looked at them with a puzzled, how the hell, look, just as my mom entered the dining room. I again almost jumped out of my skin as my 100 pound 5'2 mother lunged at my 6 foot 325 pound father, howling at dad to leave him alone and don't touch him. I hit the lights for the dining room which can be in full brilliance and I can see my mother as her hands along the side of my father's face, her fingernails digging into the back of his ears with blood running down his neck. My father has a grip on her shoulders. I forced myself between them and split them apart, telling my mother that dad didn't do this and explained what happened. I asked them if they couldn't feel that something wasn't right in the house. They seemed to have cleared their minds. Dad and mum talk. Mum doesn't know what came over her and was just in full mama bear mode. Dad cleaned the blood off his neck, then we all talked. This time it seemed my parents might be grasping that something else might be at work here. Dad went to check the door to the back stairs. He said it wasn't wide open, but was mostly closed and unlatched. The afternoon of the day after the night, my parents have worked things out. My father spoke with Uncle Jay, and he decided that we needed a vacation, and we packed up some things and took off for New Hampshire for five days. Fifth entry about my house. Information from my father in 2013. So I've now reached the point where, as an adult, I started talking to my dad about all the crazy thing that happened to us when I was growing up. I'll provide that information as it's applicable. My age when talking to my dad, 40. My age for this entry, 14 going on 15. I was, it was at this point that dad revealed that the house was a funeral home before being purchased and renovated into a multi-family house. According to my father, the activity started when I was very young, only a toddler. It happened one evening after one of my aunt's friends felt something about the house and wanted to have it and then held a seance. Then the feeling in the house changed from just creepy to horrific, because my aunt realised the seance must have been the reason that the house had activity. Unfortunately, she doubled down on the issue by having that same friend come to do a cleansing. They didn't know what they were doing, just enacted something they had read in a book and according to dad, likely did it wrong and just riled everything up. My dad believed that moving was the best option for us as nothing seemed to follow if he left the house. To that end, my parents were trying to save for a down payment on a house, but we had a string of health issues that would undercut the savings. My father believed that they, mom and himself, were not in control of their emotions for my fourth entry. When we went on vacation, Everything went back to normal between my parents and I. Also, while on vacation, my uncle had the house blessed by a priest. This priest was a friend and kin to my uncle. And this is what seems to have dialed everything down for a while, about two years. That changed in July 1988. July 1988, afternoon, outside the house. Things have been quiet at home. Creepy, but quiet. I've returned to you today because I was helping my aunt and uncle load food up for our family barbecue. While carrying the trays of food, I noticed movement in the basement window. My mum and dad were outside loading our car. My uncle was behind me and my aunt will not enter the basement. What I witnessed was approximately level with the basement window, which would make it about six feet tall, about my height now. It had a human-like shape head and shoulders, and it moved quickly to side to side. Uncle? Seen it too, didn't you, lad? Me? I think so. Aye, it's been biding its time, looking for a way out. Yes, what is it? Our clan call them Daemon, and they're not natural. They find and feed on fear, anger and sorrow. They sow these emotions like crops, then harvest the field. Well, Journal, looks like I won't be sleeping the rest of my time here. Parents are saving for a new house. Night, returning home from the barbecue. We've returned home to something completely unexpected. Several police officers are on the front porch. The police talk to my uncle and dad. 
My dad comes over to us and tells my mother to take me and go to my grandmother's. Dad tells us that apparently the kid broke in and damaged the place and they're checking for missing property. We headed to my grandmother's for the night. Morning, grandmother's house. Dad returned around mid-morning. He tells us that we'll likely have to stay here for a while. Nothing was taken, but there is damage and blood in the house. A neighbour called the cops when she noticed a broken window. My dad then goes into what happened, to the best of everyone's knowledge. Someone shattered the basement window along the side of the house near the oil ports. I had a bad feeling, because that was the window I saw my uncle's dame hen in. My dad continued. They apparently cut themselves on the glass. It looked like they slipped into the basement through the broken window, got a pry bar from the tool wall, and pried the basement door open. The cops found the locked padlock on the floor by the door. Then they damaged and destroyed the doors to open up the first floor, and then proceeded to damage or destroy the interior doors on our floor, except for the attic door and our living room doors. Mom asked my dad what he thought would have happened if we had been home. The colour left my father's face and his words chilled me. I don't know. Sixth entry about my house, September 1988, afternoon. It took us a few weeks, but my dad and I helped my uncle get the doors repaired. On our floor, the bathroom door was undamaged. All the other doors had been hacked into a pry bar. My uncle was a bit skittish with working in the house as it sometimes got things riled up. We finished in relative peace. Before that, it was still early in the afternoon. The three of us took the tools down to the tool board. As we passed the step off for the storage room, the temperature radiating from the room was at least 20 degrees colder. My glasses instantly fogged over and I almost fell into the storage room. My uncle caught me and pulled me back. We quickly gathered the tools I dropped, my uncle talking quietly under his breath. Do not look into the room, lad. Seek not the dame hen. We got the tools over to the board, only to discover all the tools are on the floor. We quickly get the tools back on the board, but the three of us can hear booted footsteps behind us by the basement stairs. My uncle decided to use the auxiliary stairs that bring us up a narrow stairway to the first floor into what I always thought was a closet was actually a stairwell into his living room. As we locked the door, something pounded on it three times. We run to the main basement door, pull it closed and clap the padlock on it. This door also gets pounded on three times. We backed away as the door rattled against the frame, then stopped. I had a quick word with my uncle. I thought it was gone. No lad, dormant maybe. We all went upstairs to wait in our living room. My uncle for my aunt, who was out with friends, and my father and I for my mother, who was working late. The phone rang, making everyone jump. I went and answered to hear my mother state she was just leaving work, so I let my dad know. My uncle, looking out the living room window, saw my aunt get dropped off and left to meet her. Half an hour later, my mother arrived home and I went down to the main entryway to help her with her belongings. This was something I always did because my mother worked so late before the weekend. As I met my mother at the door, before I could even greet her properly, my mother exclaimed, what is that? Looking past my shoulder. And that's when something hit me from behind, launching me outside into my mother, sending her backwards and down the outside stairs. The aftermath. ER trip for my mother and I. I got two bruised ribs, a bruised back, and a dislocated left shoulder. My mother, four bruised ribs, sprained wrist, fractured arm, and a sprained ankle. The damage, while not as severe as it could have been, wiped out the savings my parents had for moving. The official story was I slipped on a non-existent throw rug at the bottom of the stairs and caused the wipeout. Back at home, recovering. I asked my mother what she saw. She took out a Celtic cross necklace, a gift from my grandfather that I rarely see her wearing, not worked on it, forming the cross itself, and she held it in her hand and said only one word. Darkness. (laughs) 
seventh entry about my house. December 1988. I recover quicker than my mother from the September experience, but with the holidays coming, everyone is feeling a bit better. Our family tradition is to start decorating for Christmas after Thanksgiving. This means mom gets to break out her carols on vinyl and the Sears system belts out Bing, Nat King Cole, the three tenors and the like. I help my uncle decorate outside. Plastic toy soldiers, giant plastic candles, big bulb string lights, and a big plastic Santa that gets put up on the ledge outside our living room window. We secured it to the ledge and made sure there was no tension on the cords. The house, however, is still creepy. We can hear footsteps in the night, banging on doors and occasionally walls. And we all had this uneasy feeling with the bathroom mirror, to the point we permanently hung a thick cloth over it. But no big activity since September, and Christmas is typically a safe time of the year. Christmas Eve, my uncle always has a huge party. Lots of laughing, singing, drinking, lots of Irish prayers answered. Now traditionally, my uncle will announce that he thinks he hears reindeer bells, which gets the kids wanting to go home and officially ends the party. This year, however, it was a younger cousin who shouted, I hear Santa's footsteps, about two hours before the party was set to end. Sure enough, there are loud footsteps overhead, when all of a sudden, the room breaks out in peals of young children screaming. As right out the large front window, Santa swung back and forth, extension cord wrapped around his plastic neck. My father and I bolt upstairs because we know the plastic Santa was right out front of our living room window on a large overhang. I reach the stairwell door and to my surprise, the door is closed and locked. I get out my key and open it as my dad gets to the landing. I'd honestly expected it to be open. Inside, all the lights in the house are off, including our Christmas lights. Grab the flashlight that's on the kitchen counter near the door and shine the light down the hallway. The bathroom, pantry, living room, and parents' bedroom doors are closed, and the hallway runner is pulled back to the living room door. We go down the hallway and open the door to the living room. It takes a moment for my father and I to register what we see. The living room window is wide open with the plastic Santa gone, but the window plastic sheet is intact and still sealed to the window frame. We tear the plastic off, pull the Santa up and secure it back in place. We close, lock, and dad gets the plastic to seal the window once again. There was no wind and no ice. Dad finishes applying the plastic sheet and tells me to go get my mother's hairdryer from her dresser top so we can seal up the plastic. I get the hairdryer and as I return to my father, I forget about the hallway runner. It tangles around my feet and I fall. As I'm on the floor, I think I see someone in the light of the door frame to the stairwell. But when I pull myself up, no one is there. I give the hairdryer to my father and about 10 minutes later, we have the window sealed up. The stairwell door bangs once, and then we hear another door bang and assume it's the basement. We go around and discover the Christmas lights unplugged, which we most definitely know they were not when we left. We return to the party. No one seems to have noticed anything. I explain to my uncle in private what happened. Family starts filtering out and the party ends. My father slips me a swig of rye, to which I cough, splutter, gulp, but do keep down and my mother returns home for midnight mass. We retire upstairs. The change in the house is like entering the eye of a storm. It's suddenly calm and peaceful, but you know, it's only temporary. Eighth entry about my house. February, 1989. Things have changed in the house again, and not for the better. After the new year, I've noticed my dad staying awake longer, late into the night. He had always been a light sleeper and usually got home from work and power napped till my mom got home. But he always went to bed between 10 and 10.30 and woke up for work at 3.30. But now I'm listening to him and it's just after midnight. The weird thing is I've seen him standing in the middle of the dining room, staring into my room. I've also seen him in the middle of the hallway and look into the kitchen. One night, he was in the middle of my room, looking at me. I tried to talk with him, but he just wouldn't respond. 
just shaking his head slowly no. He snapped out of it later and just went to bed. I've tried talking to him about it and he said he doesn't remember. March 1989. Dad's still doing that standing in the room. I'm getting worried. Mom doesn't remember him getting up so I'm thinking he's not going to bed. Sunday night I found him in the kitchen. He had something in his hand. I could tell from the light from the window it was metal. I backed off to my room. I heard him drop something into the sink before going to bed. In the morning, I discovered it was a kitchen knife. I made sure to move the knife block off the counter and onto one of the other cabinets after that. Late March, 1989. Tonight at about seven, Dad fell asleep on the couch and was having a bad dream. He kept muttering that they are coming, they are coming. They are here. He started tossing and turning. I tried to wake him up. As I did, his hand shot out and he grabbed me by the throat. His hand felt like ice. Pounding on his forearm was like punching concrete. His other hand was right in my face. Index finger curled as if holding something. His finger flexed and he snapped out of it. Pulled me into a hug and apologised. Dad never showed open affection and never apologised. I asked him what's going on and he said he would tell me one day, but not today. Mum will be home soon. Tonight is her late night. I moved the knife block into the pan cabinet again. April 1989. My dad just woke up from a nap, sweating and having trouble breathing. He was complaining about something inside him and that it hurt and that he needs help. Mum took him to the emergency room. The house is eerily quiet literally and figuratively. Hours pass when my mother calls. She's crying. She tells me my father had a heart attack. She's staying with him. My grandfather's coming to take me to see him. We arrived at the hospital and rushed to my father's room. A priest was leaving the room, obviously saying a blessing and seeing us, he started to say words that are obviously meant to comfort, but I just wanted to reach my dad. Dad was in a room, awake, but in some pain and discomfort. Tubes and wires everywhere. He was going to be headed to surgery for a procedure to clear the brockage. There was some danger involved, but it was less risky than doing nothing at all. They wheeled him from the room, mom's a wreck, and we all waited together. The surgeon informed us that the procedure was successful. That they still need to evaluate the damage to his heart, but at least he's out of immediate danger for now. Dad spent eight days in the hospital, a couple weeks more on home rest. It appears our carefree days of large extra cheese, onion and pepperoni will be at an end. No more standing in the room. He goes to bed around 9.30 now. Mom's going to church again. I'm just glad to have my dad, even if it cost us the savings for moving out of our own house. It's still quiet, but I can help but think. Was the house doing this to keep us here? I hate this house. Ninth entry about my house. June 1989. I really don't know what's going on with the house. Dad's recovered well. We go fly fishing on the weekends with one or both of my grandfathers. Mom goes out with friends or visit my grandmothers. Basically, we try to be as home as little as possible. Mom said something tried to push her down the stairs after she got to the top. She caught the handrail and didn't fall, but had a gnarly bruise on her shoulder. This kind of freaked her out as seeing how it hasn't been so long since I was a human wrecking ball. We, dad, uncle and paternal grandfather, have been working in the attic and have included me. We're building it into an attic Irish pub. Something is not happy about the pub. We have to use the back stairs to get to the attic. Every time we carry bags up they split. Plastic tote handles snap and the cold radiating from the basement door is so strong you can sometimes see your breath. My uncle and grandfather are great woodworkers and the pub is coming along nicely. My father has been teaching me billiards, eight ball and nine ball and we're learning snooker together despite not having a 12 foot snooker table. My grandfather brought over a handmade plaque that reads Sullivan's Pub. It has Celtic knots around the border and a Gaelic phrase. 
My grandfather explains it to everyone in his thick brogue. Listen here, lads. I got some old magic from home. This here means Ireland protect those that cross this threshold. He hung the plaque on the door. The attic was where we would go to watch sports, shoot pool, and became a place where the clans came together. It was finished July 4th, 1989. July 1989. We're starting to hear animal noises. All kinds of animals. Then there are scratches. Deep scratches being left in the door and walls near the attic door. The scratches are always in groups of threes. The wall has been pounded on at night. My closet is once again creaking open despite the hook and eye lock on it. Now I'm also seeing something walk past my door in the early morning hours and it's huge. It blocks out the street lights from the living room window. There's also a smell to it again. It's like wet moss and old copper pennies. There are scratches on the inside of my closet door and walls. Also, I'm seeing owls outside my window. These could be the old barn owl, but it's never sat looking into my window all night. My friends don't come over anymore. They say even just standing on the porch makes them feel unsafe. One even went so far as to say it felt like something bad was going to happen. Tenth entry about my house. August 1989. Saturday morning. Hot. Humid. My mum left for a trip with her sisters. She's headed north where it's a lot cooler. Lucky. So it's just dad and I for the weekend. We have a day of fly fishing, playing pool and watching old movies together. And generally trying to avoid the sun. Fishing was good. We caught a ton of sunfish. Eventually, it just got too hot to be out in the sun, so we packed it in and headed off for home. Afternoon. By this time, we had to be pushing 100 degrees. It's so goddamn hot out. My uncle has installed an old AC window unit for the pub. It's good enough to take the humidity and some of the heat out of the open room. Dad planned ahead and got a case of Yacht Club soda. For me and naturally, my uncle some Irish ale. We listened to Gaelic tunes and played pool. Now the attic pub has become an oasis in a sea of bizarre events. Nothing happens in the attic. Outside the attic is another story. Entering the attic, the door will bang as if something wants to get in. The finish on the door will be scratched. The walls will pound. Around the door it will start to smell. At first like wet moss and body pennies. Then it got really bad like rotting food and body odour. After shooting pool and hanging with my uncle, we head down to the floor. On entering, we hear this high-pitched beeping. We find that it's my father's weather alert receiver. He turned the volume up. NWS. Severe thunderstorm watch issued. Tornado watch issued for this afternoon and into the early morning hours. This is a new one for me. We don't get tornado watches issued often. Once every couple of years, or if there's a hurricane... We let my uncle know to stay tuned to the TV and radio. The storm. Nightfall. Dad and I had spent the better part of the evening watching old movies. We'd see flashes of lightning off in the distance outside the living room. It was almost like a strobe light. Dad flipped the TV over to a local station, just in time to catch them interrupting the programme, to let us know we are now under a severe thunderstorm warning. Vivid lightning, hail, and the possibility of a tornado. Now we both realised how this could go bad. If a tornado did form, we'd have to head into the basement. At night. During a storm. Knowing what it was like down there. Now we could hear the thunder rolling. And the flashes of lightning were brighter. We turned the living room AC off and opened the window a bit. My father believed that the open windows helped equalise some of the air pressure. In the event of a tornado. He said he learned that in the army. What it did do was let the outside air in. And you could smell the ozone from the change in the air. Sure enough, the next flash strobed the house white, like blinking your eyes rapidly. Count, make five Mississippi, and boom, thunder. Next lightning strobe lit the house up again. Up green, and I happened to glance towards my room. I saw that my closet door was wide open. My father asked me if I saw green when the lightning flashed. Before I could say anything to my dad, the room lit up purple. Still looking into my room, the door was shut. 
Another purple flash and four Mississippis. Boom. More lightning. Green and purple and a huge boom. I saw my closet door fly open. The doorknob had been embedded in the drywall. Green lightning flashed. Count to Mississippi. The entity. I'm writing this the following morning in the safety of daylight. I never want to go through what happened last night again. I'm hoping my memory is accurate. I'm sure this will haunt my dreams for years. I remember the sudden absence of electronic sound as the power cut out. The crack of thunder indicative of a ground strike. Black punctuated by flashes of green and purple, constantly rolling thunder. Dad asks me to get the extra candles and flashlight from the stash in the kitchen while he gets my mom's candles from their hope chest. I remember leaving the living room and going into the hallway, close to my parents' room. The lightning is flashing and the thunder is so loud. They're both nearly constant. The heart of the storm must have been just over us. The winds picked up and started howling like a pack of wolves. I could see into the kitchen. The door to the back stairs was wide open. It was locked. I know it was locked because I locked it. Then something stepped out of the bathroom. Not funny, Dad. What was in front of me was as big as my dad. As the lightning flashed, I saw it move to its full height. The hallway was at least eight feet high and four feet wide, and this thing took up most of it as I couldn't see past into the kitchen. This entity was bigger and wider than my father, and suddenly a hand was on my shoulder pulling me back. That's not me, boy. Words I hope to forget from my father. I cannot look away as my father tries to pull me back. The entity is black. Even in the lightning, it's as black as can be. It had arms long and thick, ending in hands that it touched both side walls of the hallway. These hands appeared to be what I can only describe as hawk-like talons. It had a massive head, and the lightning would reflect back from three points. One higher and centred. The other two about where you expect eyes. It tilted its head like a dog hearing a high-pitched sound, and then started to move its head side to side till it was moving like a blur, and only the colour of the lightning flashes reflected. It started to move at us. My father pulled me back hard and we were just about at the end of the hallway. Shit! A peal of thunder mixed with every kind of animal cry you could think of tore down the hallway. The entity gouged the wall near the pantry door. When it howled, the area under its eyes got even darker. My father flung me into the living room, stepped inside and closed the door behind him. We lit my mother's candles in the living room. The light cast shadows on the walls. These shadows moved differently than the flickering of the flames, like they scurried under the door and away from the light. The lightning flashed, the thunder boomed, the wind howled. The things in the hallway slammed the closed door. My father moved to shut the door between the living room and the dining room. The living room was closed off. Dad opened the window. We would jump if we had to. Each door pounded. Dining room, then hallway, and the shadows would creep under the door, only to shrink when the candlelight touched the door. My dad took down an antique wood-framed polished silver mirror from the wall and put it behind the candles, reflecting the candlelight on the doors. The animal sound continued and got louder. Something walked up and down the hallway. A thunderous crash from outside as a huge part of oak tree came down. Lightning flashed, still that odd green and purple colour. The storm raged for a while longer. It felt like hours, but we didn't have power, so no idea what the time was. We waited for the thing to burst into the room, but it never did. The candles burned all night. The storm passed. The smell of wet grass and broken wood replaced the ozone smell. All became quiet in the house except for the dripping of water. Eleventh entry about my house. August 1989, after the storm. As I write this, I'm honestly thankful for making it through the storm in the night. First off, Mama's is okay. No storms up her way. She'll be home later after learning about the storm damage. As to the storm damage. The winds brought down a good part of the old oak tree in the backyard. It hit the AC window unit in the attic and tore the windows and frame out. We salvaged what we could from the attic, 
notably my grandfather's plaque, but a lot of the woodworking that was done was lost to rain, wind and hail. On our floor, the ceilings are damaged from the rain that got into the attic when the AU Senate tested gravity and lost. They'll need to be replaced. My room, the closet was opened so forcefully that the hinges are partially out of the frame, and the doorknob is indeed embedded into the drywall. I can't be positive, but I think I hear a faint whisper from the permanently open closet. Come. I tried using my mother's boombox to record on a cassette, but I think it's too soft. The hallway was slashed down the drywall. Three furrows dug about three quarters of the way through. Whatever it did, well I know what it did, was sharp and likely could have palmed my entire head with no difficulty. The living room door and frame was badly damaged. The hallway runner got sucked down the hallway and ended up in the sunroom. From the sunroom, we could see damage to other houses. There was a swing set in our backyard. We don't own a swing set. The garden was crushed. Afternoon. My uncle came upstairs and I swear he looked older than he did last afternoon. After making sure everyone was okay, my uncle looked to the hallway walls. It was here, wasn't it? My uncle asked us and we could only nod our heads. Come on, lads. He motioned us to follow him and we did. Down the back stairs to the first floor. Oddly, the stairs were wet from the water that came from the attic. The door to his living area was pushed in. Wood splinters everywhere. The basement door was crushed outward. The door to the backyard was wide open. Another large branch from the oak tree came down apparently. A neighbour's cat was sitting in the yard sunning herself. I'd always given her some food or water when I saw her, so she came to me to let me know that she was hungry. When she got near the basement door, there was an odd animal sound from the dark basement that was followed by the same breathy whisper from my closet. Come down. This time, I'm positive I could hear a whispered voice. The cat must have heard it too because it crouched down, side to the door, back arched, and she hissed and spit before running off. The hairs on our arms are standing on our end as we continue to hear the whisper of come see from the dark open basement. I heard it, I know I did. And with their eyes moving back and forth, I could tell that my dad and uncle heard it too. My uncle regained himself and explained that something, he paused, hearing a whisper of the word me. Something appeared to him and my aunt in their kitchen. My aunt thought it was an animal, enraged by the storm. We heard more animal noises from the basement. The growl was my guess. My uncle continued as he mentioned how my aunt bolted for their living room. My uncle told us how the entity moved from their kitchen to the stairwell and he heard what sounded like hooves, bone, going up the stairs. My uncle came upstairs to see what damage would be covered by insurance and what damage would not before heading out to get lumber and plaster. Evening. We boarded up my closet door and we helped my uncle board up the attic window. It felt violated in the attic like all the joy and hard work was lost. To make matters worse, the whispering could be heard as we put the last screw into the plywood. See you. Later that evening when my mother returned, Dad and I agreed we don't want to tell Mom about the entity. Dad talked with my mother and decided to pick up extra shifts one weekend and Mom would start working on Saturdays in a new pilot programme to have banks open on the weekend instead of till 9pm on Fridays. Dad was determined to have us move out by next year. In the meantime, I'll stay with my grandparents over the weekends. They need help around the house and we want to spend the least amount of time in our home. We went to sleep in the early hours of the morning, or at least I tried to. I kept hearing the squeak of a wood screw slowly turning. I was startled awake by the sound of a wood screw falling from a height and hitting the hardwood strip just before my bedroom carpet. Twelfth and final entry about my house. April 1990, it's the 90s. Aside from the annoying whispers to enter the closet or the basement, the loud thumps and sets of three thuds, things have been going well. But anytime I don't see that thing, Things are going well. First off, I've been accepted into a state-run vocational high school. I'm also trying something new. Well, new to me. 
I'm trying to come out of my shell more. I'm hoping that a more positive mindset might help me keep the thing away. So yes, things are going well. In fact, over the past several months, after a slimmed down holiday season and a bit of luck, we might be moving. The prospect of moving was slow going at first, but my parents and I stayed positive, and then it happened. My parents got lucky and hit the lottery. Not the jackpot, but enough that after taxes, they now have enough money to do a down payment and reduce the amount of money needed to be borrowed. This nightmare could finally be coming to an end, the light at the end of the tunnel. There are three solid knocks on my new one since the storm closet door. This seems to happen more and more to remind me not to get too happy. So I gave the door the finger. I'm not letting this place take this joy from me. June 1990. My parents are assholes. Well, only in the sense that they pranked me good. It's the last day of school and I had just gotten home. All my stuff was gone. All my parents' stuff was gone. I went to the phone to call them at work. No dial tone. I went to the living room on the TV. I tried to turn on the lights. No power. The thought that someone broke in again was quickly put aside when I heard laughing from the sunroom. My parents just popped up from the sunroom and honestly scared the hell out of me and told me to get my stuff and that we're going for a ride. We head down the stairs and mom and dad head outside. As I reach the front door, I hear the hallway door beh and behind and above me open and then slam closed. And what to me sounds like heels moving quickly on the stairs. I exit and close and lock the front door. We drove to another town and pulled up in front of a blue slided raised ranch off a back road. We went inside and it felt like what home should feel like. I spotted my grandfather's plaque over the door and that's when I knew this was our home. I found my bed. There was an AC unit in the wall but under my room's window. Holy crap, I'm not going to swelter this summer. This town is closer to the vocational school I'd just accepted into and the yard was definitely big enough for a dog. My father tells me that we'll no longer be sleeping in our old place. Years of stress just washed away. First night in our new home. Mom is sound asleep. Dad and I are on the back deck. Going over how tomorrow we get the rest of the furniture. We need to be extra careful not to take anything from the old place that we found in it when we moved in. Sometimes I think Dad forgets I was three when we moved in. Early the next morning. I awoke early with that initial panic of where I was filling me. Remembering the new house I got up and walked around. I went past my parents' room, past the bathroom, into the kitchen and dining room, into the large common room. Home. I went downstairs into the basement. I was actually in a basement in the middle of the night. Turned on the light and noticed my father had moved all his tools and fishing stuff. I realised that they must have been doing this all week long as I was finishing school. We had until the end of the month to move our belongings, and we did with my uncle's help. He would meet us at the old place and help us move the larger items like tables and chairs. We left some of our older furniture to keep the place usable for my uncle. There was talk about bringing his adult kids to fill the apartment as they were getting on in years. My uncle would crack jokes like, anything in the basement or closet you want to take? A good laugh was had, but a nervous laugh. The closet door knocked loudly three times. It had to have the final say on our last day. And with that, we finished up and left, giving the keys to my uncle. Night, home. Both my father and I had trouble sleeping, as we were concerned that my uncle being so glib might have caused problems and provoked the entity. We both found ourselves looking out over the backyard. Muggy July night, some fog covering the grass. We were both watching something large move around the edge of the property, carefully. It never crossed the property line, thinking it was a large animal. Go, you don't belong here. You have no power here. I found myself muttering over and over again. My father pointed out that it looked like a bull pointed out horns, and then it was gone. July 1990. Nothing, just peace and calm. I got the lawnmower out for the basement today. Cut the grass, cleaned it, put it away, no issue. We got an Australian shepherd puppy. She's running around on her dog run and digging a hole by the tree to nap in. I think this will likely be my goodbye entry. I think it's finally over. 
Yes, it's finally over. Peaceful dreams. August 1990. I had hoped to never write in this journal again. But one year to the day that we saw the entity, here I am. No, it's not in our new home. As I've kept this up for so long, and he meant so much to me, it's only fitting to enter this here. We received a call from my grandfather. My aunt from our old place had gone away on a trip, and when she returned, she couldn't find my uncle. She saw the basement door was open and saw his body crumpled on the stairs. She called the police and rescue, but my uncle had a massive heart attack and this triggered a fall. The fall created any number of life-threatening injuries. They pronounced it at the scene, my uncle has fallen, he's gone. My father and I feel horrible. We got away, but the devil was paid his due. Epilogue part one, conversation with my father. August, 2010. First day of hospice care, I'm visiting my father. The doctors have said without any more treatment, he has three months. Stage four cancer, riddled throughout his body. My father made the hard choices so we didn't have to. He's refusing treatment and signed a DNR because the tumors are in all major organs and inoperable. This larger than life man in my younger years who stood six foot tall and pushed 375 pounds for most of my childhood was now gaunt and almost 110 pounds. When I was a kid, he could easily hoist me in the air with one arm. Now, I was able to lift him with one arm. I bring my daughter over to visit as often as I can. She knows grandpa is sick. They watch Thomas the Tank Engine together. My father watches it even without her to keep up to the plot twists. One afternoon, my daughter went down for a nap after playing with Grandpa and watching Thomas. It was then my father decided to show me a Ghost Hunter series he started watching on TiVo. We watch a couple of episodes, and then he decides it's time to talk. Our conversation went like this. Dad. Not like our old apartment, huh? Me. Uh, no, nothing like that. Too bad these were not around then. Be no dude run that would have scared the pimples off their ass. We just had those two from Connecticut, Ed and Rose. You mean Ed and Lorraine Warren? Those two, yeah. They did assemblies when I was in school. Only ones I wouldn't ditch on. So you know it was an old funeral parlor, right? What was? Our old apartment? Oh yeah. The basement was the embalming room. Uncle's floor was for viewings and our floor was the funeral director's living space. That closet of yours was the lift to get the bodies up and down. You never worked that one out? No. Kind of explains a lot. Oh yeah. Creepy shit started happening weeks after we moved in. Minor stuff. Windows opening, door banging. But when you got older, you started talking to an old man who wasn't there. Dad? What the f- Go through the picture albums you got from mom. Think there were a few we took of you with a white mist in the background or around you. I thought that was cigarette smoke. Nope. We were told too poor to move. My parents couldn't take us, and we'll be your mom's mother. Well, for me, I'd rather naked wrestle a horny porcupine and swim in a pool of purel than live with that woman. Thanks for the visual, Dad. You're welcome, boy. See, the apartment was all we had. We used to walk, talk about the adventure the old man said you have on the treasure you would find in the cave. Okay, I don't recall that. You were just a little shit then. Now you're a big shit. Shut up and listen. The cave was your name for that area under the stairwell in the basement. You know the one. Wait, I hated that room. Yeah, that's because that was the first time you ever saw the shadow. That was Uncle Jay's word for it. Yeah, Han. It's all Gaelic for demon. Nerd. Yeah, Uncle Jay enjoyed teaching you the old language. Anyway, from that point on... It was head under the blankets, monsters in the closet. You stopped talking to the old man and thought he wanted to hurt you. You're creeping me out now. Yeah, well, it got worse. The treasure you spoke of that was safe, that was built into the foundation. Uncle Jay did some checking into the background of the funeral guy. Not a good man. Fifth generation asshat businessman and a convicted con man to boot. He was known for slipping valuables into the safe from the deceased. His partner, incidentally, was the one who set up a room in the attic 
and got the pool table up there. Notified the authorities when he learned of it. Dad, why did Uncle Jay buy this place? Dirt cheap real estate boy. Our Uncle Jay never believed the stuff till after we moved in and the activity increased. Anyway, after things started happening, Uncle Jay went into the basement where we stashed a trunk of odds and ends he found in the house. And in the trunk was a set of old ledgers where the last entry in it was, I'm done. The rat bastard turned me in. Family legacy gone to shit. May the devil take him and everyone comes to this house after us. That night, according to Uncle Jay, both the director and the partner vanished. House went up to some nephew who renovated it. Sat on the market for a while and aunt and uncle snapped it up cheap. When Aunt G's friend heard it was a funeral home, she was all gung-ho for having those communications parties and bringing in those Miss Chloe psychics. Got to the point where Uncle Jay had a priest come bless the house. Things quieted down for a while. Then they broke in. The doors and thresholds were damaged. The blessing was vacated and it came back seething mad. Go on. You mean you never wondered why we had your grandmother get you from school instead of coming home? Why we worked all those weekends and you stayed at your grandparents? Wasn't until you were older where it just wasn't possible to have your grandparents watch you after school. That's when you really started to notice things. No, Dad, never worked it out. Just thought you were saving money and that. What did it look like to you? To me, it was shrouded, had three eyes, hands like hawk talons. Big, three eyes, long horns pointing forward and clawed hands. Darker than the dark around it. After that night in the storm, we were leaving come hell or high water. Got lucky, got the cash for the payments and got out. Your mom had a priest bless the house. Pa carved and buried the four stones. You know, I'd see that damn bull shadow in the trees outside our property sometimes. The first night we saw it together, then it took Uncle Jay. You know that, right? I believe it took him from us. Saw it again the night you moved out. Over the nights leading up to your mom passing. The day we put the dog down. And now I see it like it wants me to know it was waiting for me. My dad's meds kicked in and it was lights out on the Painkiller Express. Epilogue Part 2 Conversation with my cousin September 2010 The last time I saw my extended family was at my father's memorial, or if you will, an Irish funeral. A send-off of booze, food, stories and accomplishments of the deceased. Part memorial, part comedy roast. There you have it. It's there I reconnect with my cousins. Let's jump forward several months. March 2011. Have you ever felt like your past was on collision course with your present? And while you're waiting for a thunderous boom as the two meet, instead, it's a simple electronic ringing of a cell phone that heralds the reunion. Phone rings. I see the contact info. Hello? Hey, it's Cousin One. Listen, I wanted to ask you something, but you know, it wasn't right last time we all met. Sure, what's up? So my brother and I inherited the old place you used to live at. Yeesh, you had weird things happen and now you want to know if I've ever experienced anything like it while I was living there. Dude, yeah. Yes, everything from noises to smells, banging doors, cabinets opening and closing, Toys turning on, lights flickering, temperature differences. My dad and I even saw it once. Really? Yes. There's something dark there. Now, before I go any further, let me get some paper. Okay, now, are you aware of the house's history? I'm going to put you on speakerphone so my brother can join in. How's it going? Not bad. So you guys know the house was a funeral home? No? Yeah, dad told me owned by a real crook, stole from the deceased. It's at this point I tell them everything I know about the house's past. Stunned silence. Cousin one. Everyone said we shouldn't live here, just sell it. But we thought it would be good to keep in the family. I've got the first floor, brother's got the second. My girlfriend and our kid were with me on the second. Cousin two, if you got your kid in the back most bedroom, that used to be my room. And if I were you, I would change it. That closet. It uses that closet. 
It tormented me for years with that damp closet. Yeah, we found it open several mornings in a row. And sometimes at night, I can hear my kid talking. I asked him this morning who he talked to and he said, the old man that lives in the closet. We switched rooms, but it's still opening and it's like being watched all the time. My father told me I saw an old man when I was a kid who was trying to get me to go to the basement. Yeah, no, we don't keep anything in the basement. Not after the movers got hurt. What happened? We hired some guys to move everything out of the attic in basements. Attic was fine, but guys had a hell of a time in the basement. One guy fell down the stairs. One guy, trying to get that safe move, had it fall on its leg. The crew quit over the basement, so we hired another crew. Dude, one guy lost two fingers trying to move that safe. He swears something bit them off. It's the only thing remaining in the basement. Some friends and family wanted some of the things in the house. Anyone that took anything returned it within a week. Said it made the house feel creepy. Has anyone seen it? Seen what? I'll explain the entity as I remembered it. No way! Yes. Look, it seems to build and build, then does something really frightening. Then takes time to savour the chaos it's created. Then it starts up again. Honestly, don't screw around with it. It can seriously screw with you. Like you guys ever got into stupid fights? Get so angry for no reason? If so, that's what this thing feeds off of. Yes, yes we do. How do we stop it? I don't think you can. But Dad said Uncle Jay had some luck with an Irish priest, but it was always short-lived. It seemed to be bound to the house and to the items in the house. When we moved, we left a bunch of stuff just to make sure. We'll try that. Okay. Good luck, guys. Epilogue Part 3. Conversations with my cousins. November 2011. Cousin one calls me and tells me that they've moved out and why. I'm obviously on speakerphone. Here's how the conversation goes. Man, we really, really screwed up. We had to move. We're going to put that place up and never look back. What happened? My brother had a priest from his church visit and bless each room in the house. Upstairs and downstairs. They said that they would need to do this a few times. After about a month, the house grew calm and we thought that it was over. It really was like a new place. I take it something changed? Yeah. Man, I really screwed up. After our Halloween party. See, my brother and I threw a party. Drinking was involved. We had gotten a good buzz and he had been talking about the odd stuff going on. And well, we thought it was finally gone. Dormant is more likely. You're right. It was really dumb to think it's gone. Anyway, one of our guests, this was a guy we let in on the weird things going on and right from the start, he wanted to try the Ouija board. We told him no constantly, but he would always bring it up. Goes to his car and brings out a Ouija board and says, let's find out. Cousin one, please tell me you didn't use that thing. Not in that house. I was buzzed. My brother had left the party, but three others stayed and somehow we ended up sitting around this board. Lights off, candles burning, asking questions and drinking. So using the board, we asked, Is there anyone who will speak with us? No. No one will speak with us? Yes. What is your name? No response. Were you once alive? No. What are you? We are. What are you doing here tonight? Waiting. What are you waiting for? Blood. At that, a glass on the table tipped over and shattered. We jumped up and a few of the candles went out. We continued. Did you do that? Yes. Are you going to show us more? No. Are you trying to harm us? No response. What do you want? Kill. Have you ever killed before? Yes. What did people do to you? Called. When were you called? 1908. Why were you called? Revenge. Revenge on who? Thief. 
Dolls began banging in the house. The sound woke me up. My girlfriend and I swapped bedrooms with our kid. The room felt uncomfortable and cold. I know I heard something in the closet. We heard the banging, but we continued. Is that you again? We are here. When did you come to this house? 1925. Why stay in this house? Sorrow. The mourners woke you? Hunger. Will you ever leave? Never. What if we call the priest again? No response. What if we have a psychic come in? Mad. What if we force you to leave? We are here. The table felt like it lifted, so everyone stood up from the table. Someone hit the lights and they came on. We could see blood and glass on the planchette. We all had cuts from the glass on our fingers. Just then, the doors stopped slamming. The planchette on the board, untouched by anyone, covered in our blood, moves to goodbye. That's when it all came on, growling and banging from the door in the living room, their heads down to the basements. The light seemed to dim and it looked like shadows were crawling out and wiggling from under the door. We started shouting. Cousin two. I thought you were pulling our chain a bit, but I turned on all the lights on the second floor. I could and tried to rush downstairs, but I had to stop. Stuff was coming out of the door to the basement and was starting to move up the stairs. It was ice cold if you stepped on it. I raced back upstairs and got my girlfriend. It had started to come out from under our bedroom closet like a black fog. We ran and got our kid, turned to leave, and that's when we saw it, standing in the kitchen. My kid said, look, it's the old man. But what was in the kitchen wasn't a man. It was a huge, big head. Long arms ending in clawed hands, and just as black as I've ever seen. I got my keys and ran. We ran outside, got in the car, and we were gone. Cousin one, then it appeared downstairs. My friends bolted as it hurled the planchette at us. We ran from the house. What I remember next was that both outside doors slamming shut at the same time. Me. So everyone's unharmed? Yes. Did it ever follow you after you left? No, not when we moved, or when I moved out on my own. Yeah, we're done with it. Good call. Take nothing from the house that came with it. That's all we did. The house was sold to a flipper a few months later. My research shows they had to sit on the house and ended up losing it to the bank. It was then sold to the current owner. Present day. My initial contact. I reached out via snail ale to the current owners of the house. Hello. This will likely be the most bizarre note you'll ever receive. When I was a kid, I grew up on the second floor of this house. I've included a printout of the layout of the second floor. The house was once a funeral home, and I'm writing because I've been sharing my experiences with strangeness. And it's really awakened my sense of responsibility about this house. I'll be blunt. This house has a dark entity about it. I know this will sound crazy, but I've seen it. I lived in terror of it for years. I was terrorized by it, physically assaulted, and I believe it went as far to oppress my family. The basement is unnerving. Have any children started to have an imaginary friend? The old man? Here's an email address where you can respond if you want. Please forgive the lack of identification or return address but I've learned to be wary of anything physically coming from the house. A few days later, the email address gets a hit. Current owners. You're not crazy. We've seen it too. Your letter arrived, and I admit my partner and I were very sceptical, but you captured the layout of the upper floor perfectly. It's odd that we actually took comfort from knowing we're not going crazy. We moved in about eight or nine months ago. The house was undervalued for its size, so we thought we got a good deal. Being non-essential workers, we're both quarantined at home and it feels like something is drawing on the fear and uncertainty. My partner believes she has a gift, and the night after we closed on the house, she couldn't sleep. She said we made a mistake and that something was waiting for us in the new house. I was always sceptical about the paranormal, but lately, I'm thinking there's more to this world. We moved in. On the first day, the home stunk of rotten eggs, and it would go away in return. When not smelling like eggs, it was like compost. 
It was so strange. Our cat will hiss and growl in the middle of the night, and will find her gaze locked on the door to the basement, or some random corner. We hear footsteps on the second floor, but no one is renting the apartment. We call the police once convinced someone was up there. They heard the steps and started an investigation. The doors and windows were locked. No one was up there. One day, we saw a figure a good seven foot taking up the whole window frame of what was your bedroom window as I was gardening. It appeared to be watching us. My partner tried to get a picture of her on her phone, but the file was corrupted. You mentioned an old man, and I had a long pause right there. My partner and I don't have any, but we do have a nephew. He's been going on about the old man that talks to him in his playroom. The room is the one directly under your bedroom. My partner has studied Reiki and is trying to push positive energy into the home to force out the negative, but so far has had no luck. I absolutely love this old hotel, and any chance I get to head to it, but the interesting thing about this hotel is it's haunted. The most active room of the hotel is room 314. It's referred to as the princess room, as this is the room that the hotel's founder's wife, Carolyn, would stay in. Her original canopy bed is in this room. That being said, you don't need to stay in that room to experience activity. My wife and I stayed in the hotel for our 15th anniversary last year, and the story we got to take away is the one I'm about to share. We stayed in one of the hotel's corner vista rooms. Phenomenal views, but they're located at the end of the long hallways. My wife and I go to dinner in the main dining hall, and they set up a table for Carolyn with the original china and silverware every night. I took a photo of the table and went and had dinner. As we finish and leave, my wife notices the knife and fork are on the plate. We mentioned it to the hostess, who immediately tells the manager next to her that she did see the silverware move. My dumbass forgot to get a picture of the silverware position post-dinner. After going to the speakeasy club for a few drinks, we start to return to our room. But in the hallway halfway down the floor is a huge white mist. Its form becomes somewhat more human-like as I fumble for and drop my phone. It tilts what would be its head to us and then vanishes into the room. The room is 314. We go to the main desk to speak with one of the people, and they call the manager. The manager listens, writes a few things down, and says we're the third party that evening to report seeing Carolyn in the hall. The hotel has a small book of all the images of Carolyn that have been captured over the years, and you can request to view it during your visit. There have never been malevolent reports of encounters with her, but she has been seen many times, and the waitlist to get this room is very long. I'll start off with explaining my family and living situation. My wife and I have three children, her daughter who's seven, my son who's nine, and her son who's ten. We don't have any children together. My wife and I share a bedroom. Her daughter has her own room, and our boys share a room with a bunk bed. Her son sleeps on the bottom bunk, and my son sleeps on the top bunk. They are all three with us full-time, and visit their other parents every other weekend. My son has always had some behavioural issues that stemmed from us living with my parents for some time, and the things they allowed him to get away with when they were watching him. I feel as if I'm also to blame for some of the issues, because I'm not a super loving, affectionate person, and I believe that every child needs that from their parents. When my wife and I first started dating, my son got along great with her two children, aside from some jealousy and selfishness traits that come from being an only child. But as the relationship progressed, the two boys started butting heads a bit more. For the past few weeks, my son has been calling my stepson an idiot multiple times a day. He gets in trouble for doing this, and when asked why he chose to call names, he says he doesn't know and tears up like he's confused. He's also been staring and glaring at my wife with a blank expression that makes her feel extremely uncomfortable. And he's also lunged at her a few times in a threatening manner. My son has never done these things before and it just seemed like it started to happen out of nowhere. We have him in counselling and are working to resolve these issues. Before I get into explaining the events that we experienced that last night, 
I want to explain the one previous experience we had in our bedroom. My wife and I were laying in bed one night. I was asleep and she was awake. She started nudging me which woke me up and told me that she was seeing a shadow figure in the corner of our bedroom. I looked and didn't see it at first, but as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could see it as well. It was a dark, translucent figure that stood maybe five and a half to six feet tall, and it was just standing in the corner of our bedroom. We stared at it for maybe two or three minutes, and it started to fade away until it disappeared completely. Neither of us felt threatened or unsafe, but we were definitely creeped out. That was about two years ago, and we haven't had anything else happen until last night. Fast forward to last night, we were playing a video game online, Call of Duty, with my sister, her boyfriend, and a couple of their friends. It was around 7.30, and I started to feel dizzy and nauseous, so I told her I was going to head to bed. She woke me up around 9.30 to smoke a cigarette with her, but I started to feel dizzy and nauseous again, so I headed back to bed. I laid there for a while, unable to sleep, and started to get cold chills and goosebumps, and had an uneasy, uneasy feeling. My wife came to bed around 11 o'clock and fell asleep pretty quickly, but I was still unable to sleep. I laid in bed for what I assume was about half an hour and started to hear thumping and tapping around our house. Some noises were in our bedroom, some sounded like they came from our kitchen and some from the kids' bedrooms, etc. I then heard what sounded like one of our kids walk down the hallway and into the hallway bathroom and slam the door. I thought that was odd because none of our kids slam doors and they usually don't wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I started to hear light talking, whispering almost, and then I heard a female voice say, My name? Do you want to go do that thing? I thought it was my wife asking me to go smoke, so I attempted to roll over and ask her why, but I was unable to move or talk. I started to think that I was experiencing sleep paralysis, which I've never had before, but I knew that I was definitely awake. I thought about some things I've read online and other places about commanding spirits, entities, to leave my home, leave me alone, etc. I was finally able to say, leave me alone. And when I did, I saw a light flash in our bedroom window and saw something drop from about shoulder height onto the floor, which made a loud thump sound. It reminded me of someone dropping a cell phone or TV remote. I started to freak out but was finally able to move, so I shook my wife's arm and woke her up. I had to turn on her phone light and nothing was there. I got up and turned on our bedroom light to start looking for whatever was dropped and once again, nothing was there. I explained what happened to my wife and she was obviously scared at this point. We laid in bed for a few minutes and started to hear thumping noises coming from the boys' room where all three of our children were sleeping. So I got up turned their lights on and checked on them, but they were all asleep. I laid back in bed and a few minutes later, we heard something fall in the boys' bedroom again. I got up, turned the lights back on and saw that a book had fallen off the top bunk onto the floor. But the book was open, face down on the floor. Think of it as an A with the spine facing up and the four edges of the book touching the floor. The book were about two feet away from his feet at the foot of his bed so I didn't think he would have been able to knock either of them off. Her two children woke up when I was about to leave the room and followed me to our bedroom, so we let them sleep on the floor. I must have fallen back asleep, but a few minutes later, I awoke to my wife hyperventilating, and she said that she had looked to the same corner of our room and saw the figure again. But this time, it was standing over her two children in the middle of the room. I looked, but couldn't see it, and she said it had vanished again. We heard a few more thumps and thuds throughout the night, but nothing else happened that I would consider extreme. My wife seems to think something may have attached to or possessed my son, taking his behaviour into account, and I'm scared for the safety of my son and my family in general. Our neighbour is the pastor of our local church, and I'm going to speak with him after work tonight, to see if he's willing to come bless our home and see what his thoughts are. But at this time, we're scared to go back to our home because of what happened last night. To give some background to working on G-Wing or Golf Wing, G-Wing used to house death row inmates, 
as they await their executions in the prison. It's set up similarly to other wings in the prison, except a little different. The wing is divided between three floors and six rows of 17 cells each. We no longer house the death row on the wing, and the first floor is the only floor with inmates housed in the cells. These inmates are open population inmates placed in disciplinary confinement. The second floor contains five supermax cells. The third cell down on the right side row actually held Ted Bundy and is a supermax cell. The rest of the cells on the second floor are empty and still have TV stands. The third floor is empty as well, with regular cells. Our quarter deck is a small 15 by 20 ish on the second floor, where we have a desk set up and a few chairs. Bathroom and break room with a fridge and microwave. The quarter deck is where the officers chill while in between rounds and activities. The staircase that goes to all three floors is directly to the right of the quarter deck, next to the front door of the wing. The wing is also generally dark, and the emptiness of the wing, keep in mind this wing is meant to hold over 100 inmates, and only usually holds 30-ish inmates on the first floor, gave the wing a dead silent foreboding feeling. Now that you understand the way the ex-death row wing is set up, I can go ahead with the stories. When I first started working the prison, I was told by many COs that G-Wing is the easiest wing to work due to you only having to walk the two hour rows on the first floor, making your rounds quicker and easier. However, the trade-off is that the wing is fucking creepy, with long, dark, empty rows, flickering lights, out-of-place noises, footsteps, doors opening on their own. This wing had it all, but everyone picked it because, after all, it's the easiest wing to work. I finally worked G-Wing for the first time about a month ago, and still remember the first time I've ever dealt with something just so unexplainable. I entered the wing at around 6ish p.m. and proceeded to do my first rounds, basically just making sure all the gates were locked, showers, closets, pipe chasers, everything. After doing my round and everything was locked and all my inmates were good, me and the other COs started shooting the shit. Around 9 p.m., the first weird thing happened that made us all question but not really freak out. We had the second floor pipe chase open to the quarter deck, our smoke spot, and I and another unarmed CR were burning up when we heard loud clangs above us on the third floor catwalk. Keep in mind that the only way for someone to go on the third floor catwalk in the pipe chase would be to have the house keys to unlock that pipe chase, which were on my hip. We brushed it off as a rat and kept smoking and continued the shift. I'm unsure of the exact time this happened, but it was after 2am and before 5am. Me and the other two COs were on the quarter deck talking, when we were cut off by a long and loud creaking noise from the third floor. We all agreed that it sounded like the row gate being opened on the third, so we grabbed our flashlights and ran up the stairs, thinking that somehow an inmate from the first floor escaped, and made it to the third floor without us noticing, all of which was very improbable but it was the only logical thing we could come up with. We arrived on the third floor and immediately began checking the row gates which were locked, and so were all the closets and cell doors, but we know we heard it. All three of us did, and we're certain it was a door or gate swinging open. We went back down to the quarter deck and quietly talked the rest of the night. My second experience actually happened recently when I was assigned to G-Wing again, and genuinely shook me worse than the last experience. We were hanging out on the quarter deck when I decided to fuck with Bundy. I grabbed my flashlights and walked down the side two row with the supermax cells, until I came up to the third cell. The lights were already on in all the cells. I looked inside the cell just checking it out and building up my confidence before yelling, Ted Bundy, you a bitch! Right as the last word left my mouth, the cell light turned off and turned back on and I felt like I was freezing. I quickly ran back to the quarter deck and told the others what happened, and I could tell they were each trying to figure out whether or not to believe me. Needless to say, I didn't mess with Bundy anymore on that wing. Those are my two personal stories, but any CO that has worked that wing can tell you a thing or two. Even the inmates that are housed on the wing are terrified and always silent. I remember asking them why they're so quiet, to which one of them has been in G for a while stated, because, sir, uh, the police aren't the only ones we see walking down the row, and he left it at that.
Another inmate who used to be on death row and housed in Ted Bundy's old cell was hearing Ted in the cell along with other voices and tried telling the wing sergeant that he needed to be pulled out. The wing sergeant wouldn't pull him so the inmates cut up his arms and passed out from how much blood he lost and almost died. Just so he wouldn't be in that specific cell. Other CEOs and myself also talk about feeling a sense of dread when walking down the empty rows, which I've also felt and seen shadows moved from the peripheral view. When I was 13 years old, I went down with my mother and stepfather to Tennessee to visit family members on my stepdad's side of the family. That's where I met my cousin TJ. We became fast friends and I stayed over at his house for a few nights. Then it was time to go to grandma's house for a night. TJ wanted to come and was invited. TJ and I slept in one room and my parents were in the next room. He and I stayed up late talking and being goofy kids. At some point I fell asleep. I was laying flat on my stomach in the bed when I felt my legs being grabbed and shook. Half asleep I said, TJ stop. It happened again. I yelled and half turned around. It wasn't TJ. The best way I could describe it was a boy with a shirt of fire. It looked like a fire but it wasn't flickering or moving. He smiled at me and ran to the other bed next to mine where TJ was supposed to be sleeping. It ducked and dissipated into nothing. Seconds later, TJ walked into the room. He just came from the bathroom. He asked me what was up. I said nothing. I must have looked like I just saw a ghost. I ran to the room my parents were in and raised my hand to knock on the door. But then thought for a second, what the hell was I going to tell them? So I just went back to the room and laid down. I didn't say anything to anyone. I think the only reason I got any sleep is because TJ was in the next bed to me, so I didn't feel alone, but I didn't sleep easy. Years later, I did talk about it to my stepfather. He said that grandma had a nephew that died in a fire. I'm guessing Goosebumps just writing this, and when I think of this too much, I still get Goosebumps. Over the years, I asked myself, was it just a dream? But if so, why did it happen when TJ woke up? I'm in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and what's the chances that this grandma I don't know at all had a nephew that died in a fire? I don't know what to believe, but nothing like this has ever happened again. I don't hear a lot of people that have had such a ghost experience. I can remember his face and everything. For years, I never liked sleeping on my stomach with my legs out of the blanket because of this. Either I had one hell of a dream, or this really happened. Every summer, my grandparents would go on a cruise. They had both worked incredibly hard their entire lives, and in retirement, would treat themselves to a couple of holidays a year. They had a lovely home that I'd spent every Saturday night at as a child. Every summer when they went on their cruise, they would ask me to stay and look after the dog. I loved it. I was in my early 20s and still lived at home with my parents. This was a chance for a bit of independence and to have the house to myself. I'd done it for a few years up until this point, and then instead of throwing parties with my friends which I'd previously done, I was looking forward to spending some time with my girlfriend and chilling out. My grandparents filled the fridge with my favourite foods, always left me a bit of spending money, and my granddad would always leave me a crate of beer in the garage. Awesome. The first night me and my then girlfriend didn't do anything special. We loved the freedom and loved that we were going to spend a full two weeks together by ourselves. We watched a movie and decided we were going to bed. While she was in the bathroom, all the power was cut in the house. Nothing out of the ordinary. I went into the kitchen found the switchboard and boom, there was a light. We got in bed, put the telly on and went to sleep. I remember waking up and there was screaming coming from the TV. I looked at the dressing table clock and saw that the time was 3.33. I immediately laughed it off and dozed back to sleep. The next day, we both went to work and both returned to my grandparents' house in the early evening. We chilled out doing whatever young couples do and decided it was time to go to bed. Before I went to bed, though I'd always let Bonnie out, my grandparents' beautiful dog, to go and do her business in the backyard. 
My grandparents back door led into a conservatory, which then led to a patio, which then led onto the back garden. I unlocked the back door, turned on the lights to the conservatory and patio, and moved towards the conservatory door. Bonnie didn't move from the back door. After a bit of convincing with rich tea biscuits, I managed to convince her to go to the conservatory. There was no way I wasn't letting her out and having to scrape up dog poop the following morning. I unlocked the conservatory door onto the patio, and before I had a chance to fully open the door, there was a large thud that came from the conservatory window on my right. I stood frozen for what felt like an hour. I calmly closed the door and stood in shock, wondering what it could be. I wasn't scared at this point, just incredibly startled. I looked down at Bonnie, who was staring up at me, and decided it would be fine if she did a business in the house that night. I went to bed with my heart still pounding, but didn't mention it to my girlfriend. I awoke the next night with someone on the television, screaming at 3.33. The next day was my day off from work. My girlfriend was working, though. I had the house to myself. I had nothing special planned. I was just going to chill out and play some PlayStation. I'd pretty much shrugged off the thud ordeal in the conservatory from the night before. Bonnie hadn't left any presents for me, but she did run the fastest I've ever seen her run out onto the back garden when I opened the doors that morning. I couldn't stop thinking about being woken up at 3.33 for two consecutive nights. I wondered what the consequences of it happening three times might be. I laughed it off again and tried to enjoy the rest of my day off. Mid-afternoon, I received a phone call from my girlfriend, telling me that her car had broken down while at work. This was a huge bummer, because we lived over 70 miles apart, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to see her for a while, until it was fixed. She apologised that she wouldn't be able to stay with me while I was dog-sitting, but I told her not to be daft, and that we'll see each other again as soon. That afternoon, I went for a shower. I was just lathering myself up, when I heard the phone ring. I let it ring, knowing that if it's important, it will go to the answering machine, and I can ring them back. The ringing stopped, and immediately began once again. I thought that it must be important, so I ran out of the shower, suds and all, to grab the phone. When I answered, no one was there. Just silence. No dial tone. Someone was on the line, but not talking. I must have said hello a dozen times before the line cut dead. And the second it did, the doorbell rang. Now I was in a precarious position. I'd run out of the shower full-blown naked to answer the phone and not take a towel with me. The phone I'd answered was in the kitchen, and the front door was at the end of the hallway on my right. I sheepishly stuck my head around the corner towards the front door to see who it was. There was no one there. Only a couple seconds had passed, but whoever had rang the doorbell was already gone. I wasn't scared or concerned, it was as it was broad daylight. I got back in the shower and within a minute, the phone and the doorbell were ringing at the same time. I immediately got out of the shower, wrapped myself up in a towel and headed for the door. No one was there. The phone had stopped ringing the second I left the shower. I carried on with the rest of my day and that night I didn't wake up at all, much to my relief. The next day I was in the living room watching television. I was sitting in my granddad's electric reclining chair. It was a comfy beast. It was placed in the far left corner of the living room with the TV in the far right. On the left of the chair was the window, looking out towards the street. The window was huge. It was actually three separate windows with a beautiful pattern running through all three. While I was watching television, the doorbell rang. This was quite strange, as my grandparents lived on the corner of a cul-de-sac and if anyone had driven or walked to the door, I would have seen them. I didn't think much of it, as I must have been engrossed in whatever rubbish I'd been watching. Bonnie was up on all fours in the hallway, staring at the door. I thought that maybe it was my auntie, making sure I'd not burned the house down. When I got to the door, no one was there, again. Now I was becoming a little more distressed, and being by myself was making it worse. I thought that maybe it was burglars scoping the place out seeing if anyone was home. That night, just before bed, I went to let Bonnie out. I opened the back door, turned on the lights at the conservatory and patio, and opened the conservatory door. To my horror, on the patio was a mangled bird. 
It had no head, and the left side of its body had been torn off by something. What shocked me the most was that it was still walking about. I didn't know what to do, so I rang my girlfriend. I was explaining to her what I'd seen, and when I looked back onto the patio, the bird had gone. I went outside to check to see if I could find it, but it had buggered off like it was never there. I decided that Bonnie could do her business in the house again, if she must. At this point, it was all becoming a little too much for me. I spoke to my auntie and asked if my cousin and his girlfriend wanted the dog sit instead. I explained that my girlfriend couldn't stay anymore anyway, and that they'd probably appreciate the time alone. They obviously jumped at the chance. Cowardice, I know. That night, I went home and thought that it would now all be over. I was wrong. Dead wrong. A few days after I'd got back into my comfort zone and was just sitting watching TV in my bedroom, when out of nowhere, there were two loud strums on my acoustic guitar. I sat there in disbelief for a moment, but then decided I'd had enough. I asked whoever did it to do it again. The hairs on my arms rose with anticipation and fear. I asked multiple times, but nothing. I decided it's probably best I went downstairs where my sister and mum were. As I went downstairs, I heard the guitar fall over. I couldn't bring myself to tell them what had happened for fear of them thinking I'm nuts. Another few days had gone by at this point. I was exhausted, even though nothing serious had happened. And I'm not seeing anything. I felt like I was going crazy. I decided that it's probably best that I have an early night. I put the television on for background noise and faced the wall. Within seconds, I heard my television shut off, followed by heavy breathing. I laid with my eyes shut, terrified as I heard the breathing get closer. It was deliberate and calculated. Each step it got closer, the louder the breathing got. I was frozen in fright. As it approached the bed, I could feel its breath on the back of my head. Every hair on my body stood up as I could feel whatever it was lurking over my body. A few agonising silent seconds passed, followed by a gigantic roar in my ear. I jumped to my feet from a laid down position, something that I don't think I'll ever be able to do again. I stood there breathless and pouring in sweat. I was absolutely terrified. I looked at my clock and saw it was 2.15 in the morning. I'd gone to sleep around nine-ish. What felt like seconds had actually been hours. Scared to go back to sleep, I tiptoed downstairs not to wake anyone. But to my surprise, all the lights were on. I walked into the living room and my mum was awake having a cigarette. I asked what she was doing up so late and she explained to me that she'd just had a horrible dream in which me, my sister, her and my stepdad all awoke in the middle of the night because things were floating around the house. We'd all gained telekinetic powers and could control anything within the house. I laughed along as she explained the ludicrous dream until she got to the end. At the end of the dream, we were all downstairs, dumbfounded, as to what was going off around us. And then we all heard a terrifying roar come from upstairs. We crept as a family up the stairs, following the sounds from above. As we got to the top, it was apparent that the sounds were coming from my room. We went in together and all gasped as we saw a demonic hand open the hatch to the attic. That's when she woke up and the dream ended. I didn't share my dream. Later that morning, I became so tired that I could no longer resist sleep and got back into bed. Looking at the hatch that led to the attic, I dreamt that something was trying to pull me out of bed by my feet and when I awoke the next morning, my right foot was covered in scratches. The events had really begun to take a toll on my mental well-being. I daren't sleep and I didn't want to be left alone. I dreaded coming home from work, but over another few more days without incident, I was starting to feel a bit better and less like a nutter. I was at home with my mum playing some PlayStation in my room, when my mum asked if I wanted anything from the shop. I told her I was fine and didn't want anything, so she left. The second she left, there was a loud bang that came from her room. At this point, I'd had enough. Just like when my guitar had played, I encouraged it to do it again. This time it immediately responded with two large bangs. I rose up from my chair and walked onto the landing where all the bedrooms met. 
I stood there, staring intently into my mother's bedroom. It was pitch black. I asked them to do it again. This time, nothing. I walked into her room and turned on her light to see books laid out across the floor. Obviously the cause of the noises I'd heard. I'd stood in the middle of the room and dared them to do it again. A madman talking to himself in his parents' bedroom. Nothing. I'd had my fill of whatever had been happening to me and decided that enough was enough. I told them exactly what I thought of them, using every expletive that I could think of. Some manic, crazed lunatic screaming at the abyss telling them to fuck off. A few minutes later, my mother came back from the shop. I went downstairs and explained everything that I'd gone through over the last couple of weeks. She patiently listened to me and it felt great to get this nightmarish burden off of my chest. When I finished, she told me that her, my stepdad and sister, have always feared my bedroom and it's always made them feel uneasy to enter when I'm not there. She also told me a story where while I was with my grandparents, her and my stepdad had an argument. So my dad had decided to sleep in my bed, but he hurriedly ran back to their room as something had pushed him while he was trying to sleep. She also told me that the reason I slept with the TV on is when I was a child, my actual dad passed away. And my granddad told me that my dad would come to visit me while I was sleeping. Instead of this being comforting though, it terrified me so I could never sleep in the dark. Since that day, I've never had any more experiences. I still regularly visit my grandparents at their home as they're still going strong in their 80s. And I check back in just as much with the parentos. My room is exactly the same as when I left. No one dares enter when I'm not there. I was surprised that when I moved out years ago, that my sister never took it because her bedroom was tiny. But the unnerving presence felt towards it was too much for her. This house is definitely haunted, and I think it has more to do with the house's history. It was a very large boarding house before my dad bought it. There are a lot of doors because of that, and my bedroom door even still has a number on it from when it was. I have so many stories, I don't even know where to start. A lot of them revolved around my older daughter, who seemed to be the focus of a lot of activity. I'll start with one more recent one. One day, we heard a crash above us from the attic that sounded like a piano being dropped. My husband was bathing our child, so I got my dad, who was working, and we went upstairs. When we got up there, we didn't see anything that fell. We did, however, find a wooden plank that was nailed in the middle the size of a street sign. On the plank, there were initials written in fresh chalk. Never had seen it before, and neither had my dad. That was one of the very first incidents. So last year I was pregnant and having a new baby in December and I'd been scouring the attic for my newborn clothes from my first. I was up there two days prior searching all over including this spot. I went out that afternoon and sent my husband up there to find stuff and when I got home I went up to talk to him and he showed me this handmade wooden cross thing hanging from the board with the initials on it from a dog leash. I was so freaked out because I know for a fact that it was not there the other day. I would have hit my head on it. I texted my brother who works at a funeral home if he had been up there. Only entrance to the attic is in my apartment and he insisted that he had not been up there but that he did make the cross out of Lincoln Logs when he was a kid. So I knew who made it but we had no idea why it was all of a sudden hanging there in plain sight. My husband really thought someone was messing with us or I just didn't see it the other day. But there's no way in hell I didn't see it hanging at eye level. He took it down and swung it back over it was dangling down. My brother is freaked out now too because he made the cross but he didn't attach the dog leash. We don't even have a dog. The leash was most likely for my brother's girlfriend dog when they lived there but I'd never even seen it. It was so creepy and I never figure out what it was. So a lot of my paranormal experiences have involved my daughter who is now seven. It slowed down a lot for a few years but actually started up again a lot more when I was pregnant with my second last year. 
but there have been really creepy things my daughter has said. These are all for when she was between two and three, because she was talking, but still very young. One night, I was sitting on her bed, tucking her in. We had the lights out, but a pretty bright nightlight, and I was singing to her like I do every single night. All of a sudden, she pulled the blanket up to her face and had a weird look. She then says to me, Mommy, the man said to stop singing. I was thinking, uh, what? She was now hiding under the covers and was actually really scared. So I said, who said that, baby? And she pointed over and said, the man over there doesn't like it. I'm not going to lie. I'm totally embarrassed that I'm a shit mom, apparently. But I tucked her in and left real quick. I felt bad I wasn't going to scare her more. She was okay when I left. She has said so many weird things. Once she said to me, my friend Ida comes to visit me at night. She has long black hair and a black dress and black shoes. I asked her, oh really? Does she live here or just come to visit? And she said, she just came to visit her. She was not even three and I had never spoken of anyone named Ida ever. Another time, she told me there was an owl in her closet at night that made noise. And also told me that her little birdhouse that she had hanging in a room had someone in it that talked to her. There was a time at my parents' house we were sitting at the dinner table and it was in an alcove type area with windows all around facing just all the woods. All of a sudden, she stops in a high chair and gets super serious and says, Shh, everyone be quiet. There's a ghost in the trees. And pointed outside. It was terrifying. She was always talking to someone in her room and always saying weird things that she shouldn't know. Now I want to be clear, even though my house is definitely haunted, I don't feel threatened. It's just there. My husband and I to this day feel ice cold movement that comes and goes. We hear banging at night. We hear voices. We've had things go missing. I'll be in bed and think that someone came in when they didn't. Or something will hit the bed when I'm alone. We also have a ghost cat who jumps on our bed and has even touched us. But this happened about six years ago. My daughter was supposed to be napping. She was in her crib and I was laying down in my bedroom with the video baby monitor. I kept checking it because she was unusually riled up and talking and laughing and just wouldn't go to sleep. She, but she wasn't crying, at least so I let her be. A few minutes later I picked up the monitor to check and when I picked it up I thought she was sitting on the right side of the crib. Then a second later I realised that she was standing to the left. So what the fuck is that sitting on the right? It was clearly a baby. I watched it on the monitor. It moved its head a few times which scared the shit out of me. I took a picture of the screen for proof. I went in a few minutes later, calming down, and she was laying down. There was no stuffed animals of any kind in there. I checked. There was not a cross connection with another monitor because it was the only one that had absolutely no internet hookup. Just a camera and a hand screen. It was so insane. I actually had a ghost hunting group ask to come to my house, but I declined because I really didn't want to know, and or to make it worse. It wasn't hurting anyone at least. Interestingly enough, my dad said that the people who lived here before it became a boarding house was a family that had several kids, and apparently they had maids who lived in the attic. Just so many crazy things that have happened, but this one was so scary. This is an ongoing thing right now in the house I live in. My family moved into the house in early April. My mother and her friend were just at the house before my brother and I moved in. When my mother's friend was going outside to smoke, he saw a shadow near this metal sheet shed we have. He told my mother, but she thought he was just messing with her. For a couple of weeks I was home alone and I kept hearing noises which was common because there is a tree branch on the roof above my room. But then I start hearing talking. I then pull out my phone to record and I catch someone saying hello. It was normal for neighbours to come over and talk, but this was at 2am. 
I still check the porch for people, but there's nothing. I hear things coming from my brother's room, and we have a connected bathroom. So I step out of my room and see that his door is closed. I go in the restroom and swing open the door, and when I do, I see his door is open. So I sweep the house for people. I end up not finding anyone. When my mom comes home a week later, I go to, the sh to show her the video, but I must have deleted it because it wasn't there. She said she didn't believe me, but still had her friend who was a priest come by and bless the house. Another week goes by and my brother is back, and I see him keep looking down the hall. I tell him, yeah, I keep thinking I see someone there too. He agrees with me that he thinks he sees someone. Then another week, my sister comes over. It's about 9pm, so I'm just about to go to sleep. I hear a knocking, but I just close my eyes and try to sleep. But my brother comes in the room and says sister is in the bathroom and freaking out. I go and ask her if she heard the knock too. She replies with, that wasn't y'all messing with me. It was knocking on the bathroom door. She got scared and began crying. She called our mom and told her what happened. She says she's been drinking so can't drive home. I grab my dad's knife and search the house and then the yard. Nobody was there and all of the doors were locked. So this story involves the same place, but a few different scenarios. So back when I was in college, I dated a guy whose childhood home was very close to the university we both attended. Now this house is part of a historical home district in the south, where if a home is of a certain age, you're not allowed to change it or destroy it. Any updates must be approved by the city and retain the historical integrity of the home. Or to say, this home was essentially almost the exact same since it was built in the 1800s. Now, we would often hang out at this house to visit family, and would sometimes stay over to keep his dad company. Knowing I love ghosts and a good history lesson, he had informed me that growing up the family had seen ghostly apparitions, and experienced a few things themselves. So before I start my story, I'll explain a few of the others from their perspective. The way the home was built there, was the kitchen and living space downstairs and the master bedroom. There was also a second story that involved a tiny wooden staircase that led to a long hallway, with a bedroom to the left at the top of the stairs, a bedroom almost directly in front of the stairway exit, and then a bedroom to the right at the far end of the hallway. The bedroom on the far right was mostly used for storage and that's it. He informed me he and his sister would sometimes see an apparition in this room, of a woman in 1800s fashion clothes, hair in a bun, full bottom petticoat etc, and she would always be looking out longingly through the window in that bedroom. If approached, she would always disappear. The second story was one that my ex and his mother had experienced. His mother unfortunately passed away from an illness, and at this time, she was progressively getting sicker. I say this because, as some people say the closer you are to birth or death, the easier for you to see or relate to spirits. Anyways, the ex was stopping by his home to pick up some items and just run in and out. He had parked his car on the driveway that was visible from the windows when in the sitting room. He ran in, grabbed his stuff, saw his mother in the sitting room and said hello. He made it to his car with his items and got back in when his mother called him on his phone asking him, why didn't you tell me you had a guest with you? You should know better than not to introduce a guest when you bring them over. It's in the south, traditions and such. He was confused and had no idea what she was talking about. He asked her back, what do you mean? Is it just me here? To which she replied, no, there's a girl sitting in your passenger seat. I can see her right now. To which he then noped the hell out of his vehicle and went back inside. There were also random bangs and noises that one always just chalks up to living in an old house. However, Whenever we would stay over, I would always have the same dream of what looked like someone in the shape of a man, that looked like a black shadow always standing at the edge of our bed. Now, this is the real incident I experienced on my own. One day when I was attending class, I realised I forgot to print out something for a presentation, and as I mentioned, his house was close by to the school. I checked with him to see if it was okay if I ran back to his dad's home and printed off my assignment there. He said that that was no issue, 
and that his dad was actually in a business meeting, so he wouldn't even be home, so I wasn't bothering anyone. I rushed over to the house and up the stairs to the bedroom which had the printer in it. I happened to close the bedroom door for some reason, and got on my laptop and began trying to find the assignments and print it out. While I was sitting and waiting on my printout, I began to hear someone walking downstairs. I was confused as no one should be home, so I had called my boyfriend at the time and asked if he was home. He told me no, that he was on the way to class. I asked if his dad maybe came home, to which he replied his dad was just going into the meeting as he had just talked to him. As we were on the phone, I heard the noise from downstairs begin to head my direction, and I heard footsteps clearly stomping up the stairs. Now I got scared, but possibly thinking someone had broken into the home, and I just happened to be there. I told my boyfriend to stay on the phone with me. I heard footsteps get to the top of the hallway and all of a sudden stop outside of the door of the room I was in. I freaked out, ready to run or attack. One of the two. I opened the door to no one standing there. Absolutely no one was in the house. I then grabbed my assignment and have probably never ran so fast in my life. During our first home search, we looked at a lot of homes. We thought we wanted a particular style of home. We focused on those types of homes. Our realtor found one in the northern suburb of our town. The day arrived for the showing. The realtor opened the door. The house was empty. A few pieces of furniture remained. We did the standard tour, following her from room to room. The master bedroom was on the first floor. It had Berber carpet that was snagged and messed up. My husband and the realtor went back down the hall to the great room. As I continued to look at the carpet, I was bent down looking at the carpet. I saw the realtor go past the doorway and through the door to the basement. I stood up to follow her down the stairs. The lady had short black hair, a tan coat and gold earrings. Just as I was starting to go down to the basement, I realised that my husband and the realtor were upstairs. During this moment, I took my eyes off the lady and stopped. I did not proceed down the stairs. When I looked down the stairs, the lady had turned the corner. The realtor and my husband came down the stairs saying the basement was next. The realtor went down the stairs. I followed looking at the realtor. Her hair was different and her coat was not the same and no earrings. The basement was empty. All the lights were on and no one was down there. I was spooked. That had to be a prior owner. I faked a headache and called off the next showing. When we left the house, I saw the lady looking out the window at us. I told my husband what happened. He said the realtor told him the owner had passed away. I knew the lady died in that home. My tribe believes you cannot live in a home where someone died. The ghost was not malevolent, but I feel she was letting me know. She was present. My sister married a guy who was in law enforcement. During the beginning years of his career, they were posted to various small towns. One town was small, and so to attract candidates, they offered housing in a complex. This apartment complex was on the edge of this town. The complex is surrounded by farmlands and some woods. This complex had apartments for the elderly and some subsidised apartments. Very brightly lit and relatively safe for these residents. Each apartment had a panic button. This town was so small they had no EMS. The cops came first and the nearest town would send a squad 15 minutes away. My sister just had her first child. This particular night, she was having a tough time getting the baby situated. The lights in the bedroom were off and only a hallway light was on. She was walking the baby and finally the baby drifted off to sleep. As she was bending over to put the baby in the bassinet, her eyes saw two red eyes staring at her. The window was closed and curtains pulled back with only the sheets down. My sister walked over and moved the curtains to see a face. The face was a man's face with lots of hair. Two large unblinking red eyes just looking straight ahead. My sister stumbled backwards and hit that panic button. She got the baby and went to the front room. 
Her husband was on night shift duty. He rushed back as he pulled up to the apartment. He saw it. First it looked like a man but full of hair. It turned around and dropped to all fours. It took off to the farmlands. My brother-in-law chased it on foot. As he's on its tail, several people rushed up saying in Spanish, wolf man. They had been working on farm equipment at a garage outbuilding that bordered the apartments. The wolf man had stopped right in front of them. They saw a man's face with two big red eyes, but the body was hairy like a wolf. He saw just miles of dark farmland. He gave up on the chase. My brother-in-law returned to their apartment. He encountered a resident who complained about a large dog hanging around their apartment. My brother-in-law used a flashlight to check the ground near the windows. A mixture of animal and human footprints were near that window when my sister first saw it. My sister called my mother who came out with cedar. She burned and blew it away, smoke and prayer. My mum had a ceremony done. A relative of ours started practicing witchcraft. The relative was stalking everyone. Those years were pretty unnerving. I was in Ohio at the time. Each noise I heard at night, I would think it was him stalking me. The story happened to a member of our family, but on my father's side. His sister Vicky and her daughter Amy and husband Dan. They all live about an hour outside the county town where they reside. Amy and Dan lived on a farm in a less populated area. Dan worked a regular day job and Amy worked nights as a nurse. They had two little children after the move. Dan was killed in a traffic accident. Amy had the vehicle towed to the farm. It was placed in front of the house, but a ways from the front of the house. Trouble started during the wake and funeral for Dan. Both Aunt Vicky and Amy started seeing Dan sitting in the driver's seat at all times. Amy once walked up to the truck, when she got to the truck, empty. But yet, as my cousin walked to the truck, Aunt Vicky could still see Dan sitting in the truck. Amy found several white feathers during that week. When she walked to the truck to check to see who or what was sitting in the truck, this feather was placed on the truck hood. The second feather was found as Amy walked into the funeral home to arrange services. The third and final feather was found on the dining room table, the day of the funeral. Amy's house had weird happenings on the day of the funeral. The lower level door was closed but not locked. It was locked when Aunt Vicky and Amy left the house. The front door was open and unlocked. The gun safe had marks, someone tried to pry it open. Nothing was taken from the safe or the home. Condolence cards were scattered all over the floor off the dining room table but the white feather was the only item on the table. They both stated that the condolence cards were stacked neatly on the table in piles, opened and unopened. Aunt Vicky called my mom to help. They were terrified to stay in that house. Amy couldn't understand why Dan would be terrorizing the family. My mom performed her ceremony to determine what was going on with the house. She sang her peyote songs, burned sage and conversed with Dan. First, my mother stated that someone was watching the house. Across from the house was a tree line of undeveloped property. A specific tree had a Y shape. This person had been smoking, eating and sitting undisguised. Food wrappers, piles of butts. After the ceremony, the hiding spot was revealed to my aunt, mum and cousin. The happenings of the funeral date was an actual break-in. My mom told them the person was scared off and left in a hurry. He would not be back ever due to this ceremony. The feathers were from Dan to Amy. He was expressing his love, caring and saying goodbye. My mom told me that she did not tell my relatives. She saw why the burglar did not finish the crime. The burglar went through the bottom level door. The man closed the door and went directly to the gun safe. The person had been able to get the keys to the door and used a bag of tools for the safe. As the burglar was working to get the safe open, Dan materialised. Dan scared the hell out of the burglar. The burglar was pushed physically out of the house, hence why the cards were blown off the table. In the burglar's haste, he left the front door open. To say a final goodbye to Amy, he left the third feather for her. The reason my mom said none of this to my aunt and cousin 
The burglar was their estranged son and brother. He was looking for some antique guns that he bought thought Amy and Dan possessed. The guns had been sold by my dead uncle prior to his passing. My mom turned the whole thing over to nature. Let nature exact justice. This male relative eventually lost everything in life, including his sanity. I have several experiences due to my mother's side of the family. My family is a mixture of Mississippi Choctaw and Dine. During my childhood, I experienced the spiritual side of the Dine religion. Medicine men, ceremonies, and living on the res. The females in our family of power. My mother is able to see and communicate with ghosts. She's able to perform ceremonies that she learned from her parents. They were both medicine people. My parents met in a city far from their homes. They went to BIA schools and earned degrees and certification for their respective careers. After graduation, they moved to a big city in Texas and got a house. Alright, here's my first story about my mom. Both of my parents worked. My dad worked for a big corporation on the outskirts of the city. My mother worked downtown for a private insurance company. She rode the bus line to get around. I went to a religious private school that provided after school care. My mother one day at work got violently ill. Her boss was very worried about her, so he took her home. Our home was in a suburb which at the time was quiet and didn't have a lot of natives in our neighbourhood. My mum got home and called my dad and asked him to pick me up. Mom told my dad not to worry and to come home at his regular time. My mum just decided to lie down in the living room, so she locked the house up. Since she didn't feel well, she didn't turn the TV or radio on. She remembers drifting off and had blankets on her, her trusty Pendleton. Mum woke up with a start. An old DNA lady dressed in formal clothing. Velveteen blouse and a pink shirt that was in emerald green. She wore her best jewellery squash blossom, two heavy bracelets and long beaded earrings. The woman was dressed to the nines in Dine culture. She had her hair up and covered with a green handkerchief. The woman had no face as she hovered over my mom. She had pulled up a dining room chair and sat down. The lady took her hand and reached for my mother's hand. She started to sing and chant the blessing way. My mum said she knew this voice, but it wasn't any of her large family. The old Dine lady's grip on my mother's hand was ice cold. My mother spoke Dine to her, asking her to let go. The lady said, not yet, not yet. Mama finally jerked her hand away. She got up and saw the chair was empty. The front door was open, but the storm door locked. The remnants of corn, pollen and cedar covered my mother's hair and around the couch. This woman knew my mama and was healing, but no one except my father and boss knew she was sick. My grandmother went and placed stones and it finally was revealed my mum's grandmother had done this. We moved into the home, redecorating, normal things. My husband worked swing shifts and I worked day shifts, weekends off. I was home alone at night time often. I started to notice weird knocking sounds outside hitting the house. It seemed like a regular occurrence. Then one day, the kitten stood straight on her back feet and growled, staring into the dining room. I got up, and as I walked into the room, those knocks, dings started up again. This room was the only room that the noises were present in. I decided to knock back if I heard it knock. A faint knock-knock-like was coming from the basement. I knocked back hard. Waiting and listening, I received a hard return knock in the dining room. I headed downstairs to the basement. Only items in the area were our washer and dryer and dirty clothes. Nothing scary or weird but the knocks and pings coming from the dining room above. Now, I was annoyed at this knocking. I went back to the dining room and knocked in a pattern. Once or three times and waited for an answer. This ghost knocked twice back hard. My kitten Violet is now in the kitchen counter again, standing up on her back legs, growling. Violet can see it clearly. I decided to leave the house to drive to my husband's job site and tell him what was going on. He promised to look around when he got home. 
The knocks happened while he was looking around. The knocks continued off and on and still didn't say anything to my mom. Then one evening, we were home together watching a movie. We both dozed off. To me, it felt like my husband got off the couch. I opened my eyes and a man dressed in a grey sweatsuit stood before me. His head and hands were greyed out like old TV show. I quickly closed my eyes and opened. He was still standing in front of me. The face had not filled in. I yelled my husband's name. The figure vanished. My husband again checked the house. No sign of a man, knocks or pings. Made the call to my mom. They were planning to come out. I explained to her what was going on at the house. Mom advised me to burn cedar and blow out the operation. During that time waiting for them to arrive, I didn't stay at the house alone. Violet kept growling, even though the other two cats were starting to growl and looking at the dining room. My parents arrived and my mom asked to sleep in the bedroom over the dining room. After the third night visiting, mom said it's time. Mom announced after she performs a ceremony. Mom told us for three days after that we will not speak about it. She started singing Dine Peyote songs and walking the property in all the rooms of our house. During the prayer portion, a large clanging noise emerged from the dining room. The ceremony was plain simple and lasted roughly an hour. Three days later, we asked my mother what was going on. Mom stated there were two separate ghosts. The first was a boy who frequented the left side of the property line. Mom encountered him looking at the second story bedroom. This was the bedroom over the dining room. The boy was pelting rocks at the window and the walls. Mom asked the boy why. This young boy said I'm wanting to talk to my friend. And mom said, your friend is gone. The pre previous owner of the house had one son. The young boy said you wanted to talk to him before he did it. By it, he meant he was going to kill himself. Mom told the boy it was all over. That day can't be relieved. The young boy didn't know he was dead. Mom helped him leave and go on to the light. This poor boy had been trapped, repeating the sad day over and over. He knocks and dings and pings him, trying to get our attention. To find his friend, as he tried that fateful sad day. The second ghost. The apparition was a person who lived here. He meant no harm, but loved the home dearly. Mom asked him not to appear like that. You're scaring the hell out of my daughter. Mom advised me to talk out the terms of staying here with us. We spoke to him and we're happy to have you here. We'll treat this house right. To this day, it's worked out between us. After my parents left, I asked my neighbour across the street about our west side neighbour. All this time we kept our distance from her. The widow was always drunk, loud and generally scary. We didn't know anything about the suicide and that had transpired. One year before we moved in, their son, the west side neighbour, committed suicide in their basement. The mother had found him. We now understood her behaviour. After that, we've always been kind to her. You truly don't always don't know why people drink or abuse drugs. Now we do. I asked about our previous owner's son. If he was close to the deceased boy. Aaron, our owner's son, had been a very close friend to the deceased boy. They had grown up together. One added tidbit. A year from when my mom performed the ceremony, Aaron, the neighbor's son, was visiting other friends on the street. He came to our door and asked to look at the house, his old home. Aaron took us to each room and told us what updates his dad would appreciate. I asked Aaron which bedroom was his. It was the one my mom spent the night. Aaron looked out the window and talked about his childhood friend who used to pelt his window. Then Aaron stated his father always regretted leaving the house. We didn't know the father had passed away shortly after selling the house. This was my first solo dealings with ghosts in a home, but we all, my husband, my father and I, experienced the paranormal and the power that my mother has. My girlfriend's dad went to school in Kansas, actually right around the corner of the Sally house. In the mid-1990s, he and his baseball buddies all got a new professor, who they all loved. The University of Benedictine, a Catholic university, 
At the time would provide a Victoria-era home for all the professors and their families to stay in for free of charge. However, the catch was they would have to maintain the home and work on restoring the home. Well, their new professor was living in the home, and the professor would frequently have him and his friends over to eat pizza, drink some beer, and watch some TV. And after a month or so, they noticed the professor and his entire family began sleeping in his office. This understandably was very bizarre to them. So they asked him why they were doing this, and the professor wouldn't provide an answer. So they just assumed something must be wrong with the house and tried to make sense of the situation the best they could. Then nearly a week later, the campus priest stopped him and his friends and said that he knew they were friends of the professor and they need to work on his lawn and help him out. He let the lawn go to shit when he left for his office. As they were working on his lawn, the professor and his wife showed up along with their daughter to get some more stuff and told them to leave. So they left and decided to pull some money together for a hotel room in another town so they could work on his yard and fix up the house a little bit. So the school would chill on him and so the professor and his family could relax too. The professor didn't want to accept but he did on one condition that they wouldn't go upstairs at all. So he and his family left town for a bit. When the professor left they fixed up the yard and painted some stuff in the house and of course went upstairs as all college kids would. Then they decided to have some people over and drink at the professor's house because they said fuck it. Toward the end of the night after the girls left they heard a loud bang come from upstairs. They found a paint can left up there that was knocked down but luckily the lid was on so there wasn't a mess. But as they were taking their paint cans downstairs they heard a noise from the little girls room. Every toy was in a perfect circle looking at one another. One of the guys picked up a bear and threw it across the room and they all went back downstairs. They heard another bang and all went up to find the bear back in its place. They pieced together that the bangs were the doors slamming shut. Then they were getting freaked out, but they thought ghosts and all that was bullshit. So this time they threw the toys around everywhere until they all felt a burning sensation all over their body and in their eyes. They all ran out of the house and their backs all had scratches and their eyes were all turning bloodshot. They called the professor and told him what happened. He rejoiced that he and his family weren't crazy. It had happened to them too. That's why they fled the house. After that, the professor quit and the university shortly thereafter tore the house down. My freshman year of high school, my friends and I were really into playing with Ouija boards. I was always skeptical of whether or not they actually worked, until this experience. My friends and I had gotten word that a few people at our school had started a paranormal club. We were all pretty excited to hear about this, since we all into that type of stuff. A group of about nine of us decided to go to the first meeting held after school one day. When we showed up to the room where the meeting was held, we were surprised to find that it was just us and a few others as well as the two girls that had started the club and the teacher chaperoning the meeting. One of the girls who started the club announced that for our first meeting we were going to be watching an episode of Ghost Adventures since it had some good paranormal encounters. My friends and I were pretty bummed that we were just watching a TV show. We expected to be doing something totally different. About 10 minutes into the episode, me and four of my other friends got bored. And since we were only 14 or 15 at the time, and couldn't leave until our parents picked us up, we decided to go hang out in one of our favourite teacher's rooms. We told the teacher we were at a paranormal club across the hall, and how we joined because we were into playing with Ouija boards. So my friend had the bright idea that we should play one in his room, since she knew how to make them. Our teacher was reluctant at first, but eventually just let us do it. My friend grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and scribbled down yes, no, and the letters and numbers. We got a makeshift planchette. I think we used like a quarter or something. We sat down at a table and started the game. We asked, are you there? And it slowly slid to yes. Then we asked, what is your name? It first slid to D, then O, then N. We quickly slid goodbye, since this wasn't our first time coming into contact with a spirit named Don. So a little backstory. This Don spirit had come through on multiple occasions when my friend Megan would play the Ouija board. 
He would say he was one of her family members who had passed, but upon asking her parents if they had a deceased relative named Don, they assured her they did not. So whenever Dom came on the Ouija board, we knew to just slide to goodbye and not talk to him, since we thought he was bad news. Right as we told Don goodbye, the paranormal club leaders had burst into the classroom, saying they'd been looking for us and asked why we were ditching their meeting. One of them walked closer to where we were sitting and saw the Ouija board. She started scolding us, telling us not to mess with Ouija boards, because there are bad spirits. We assured her that we knew what we were doing, since we had done this so many times before. The girl sighed and let us get on with our game. She turned around to leave the room, but before she walked out, she told us about a girl who went to our high school back in the 90s or something, and said she died nearby. She asked us if we were going to play with the Ouija board, and if we could find out the girl's name. We agreed, and both girls left the room. I'd like to emphasise the fact that none of us knew this girl's name let alone that there was a girl who died near the school. We thought it would be pretty cool if we could find out her name through the board, but didn't expect much. We then asked the Ouija board again, is anyone there? It stored for a minute and then slowly creeped to yes. I asked something along the lines of, there was a student who died here, what was her name? There was a long pause. Then the game started to piece to move. It first slid to S, then A, then R, then A, then H. Sarah. We all froze for a moment. My friend Megan broke the silence eventually by asking the board, what's your name? It spelled out Don. We all slid the planchette to goodbye as fast as we could. We then started joking about Megan's so-called relative, Don, and how he was always trying to mess with us. A few minutes passed and the leader from the paranormal club came into our classroom again from across the call. She said, hey guys, we did some research on the internet and we figured out the girl's name. It was Sarah. All our jaws dropped. I immediately started getting goosebumps. I'd like to remind you that none of us had any prior knowledge of this girl who passed away since it happened about 20 years prior. We told her that Sarah was the name we got when we asked the Ouija board. She got excited and told me and my friends to follow her across the hall. We looked at the computer she had been doing her research on and sure enough, Sarah's obituary was pulled up on the screen. She was struck by a car while attempting to cross the main road near our school. The girl also said, and this chilled me to my core, that she found another obituary for a janitor who worked at my high school in the 90s and committed suicide. His name? Don. I was haunted in the past by a little girl. She beat me in my sleep. She's gone now. And for years, that was it. No harm done. Recently, it could be the past couple of years. Every so often, I'd be torn out of a deep sleep, straight out of it, and my attention would always be on one part of the room. And more often than not, there'd be a figure there. The figures used to have no physical distinguishable traits. They were a black shrouded mass. When I'd wake up and see them, they'd quickly disappear and that was that. But they've been getting gradually clearer, becoming more defined, and they're not the same spirit each time. They've been getting closer too, and taking longer to disappear. This one, only a few minutes before writing this at about 2.57 a.m., tore me out of a deep sleep and was a stride length away from the end of my bed. I woke up, Saw it in its black robes, its arms hidden, like a monk when they put their hand into each robe. Its face was white and twisted into a smile. It was eight feet tall and it was staring directly at me. I moved towards my lamp and its face followed me, clearly watching me. Only when I reached for the lamp and realized what I was doing, did it take a quick step back. Then it disappeared when the light came on. I've never been worried about these before, but the past two have been the clearest and this is the first one to actually move away from me when I reached for the light. Something is clearly waking me up before they get to me, but the fact that they're getting clearer, closer and able to move is really fucking with me. So a good few years ago, I'd say maybe seven years ago when I was 18, 
My dad got me a World War II air raid siren for Christmas. It was seriously cool, and I took it outside immediately to give it a go. It made the typical eerie air raid siren sound. I loved it. Now, nothing happened for a long time, but then I started feeling as if I was being watched, usually at night. Then one Friday, I was gaming with my friends on Xbox Live, and in the middle of a game, I saw someone standing to my right, next to the air raid siren. I turned to look and there's this little girl in a white nightdress and long black hair facing away from me and towards the door. I was speechless. She was completely solid, like a real person, and I could even see her shoulders rise and fall as she breathed. Yet she said and did nothing. She just stood there. For the whole time she was there, I couldn't look away. I couldn't talk or anything. Then when she was gone, I returned to the Xbox chat and told my friends what I saw and we joked. I felt creeped out, but nothing else. Now this has happened several more times. Each time she appeared, I couldn't do anything except stare at her. My friends said to film her or shelter her, but I just couldn't. And this was happening at random times throughout the day. Once was midday. Each time I saw her, she was facing away from me. I never saw her face, but she was always getting closer to my bed. One time there was a woman standing with her, but she was also facing away from me and towards the door. None of my family paid any attention to me about her until I started waking up with nosebleeds, black eyes, and bruises all over my body. I looked like I'd partaken in a fight club. I was getting these beatings nightly. On one occasion, my sister and her boyfriend heard a girl giggling and ran across her bedroom. That was the only time the ghost girl seemed to visit any of my family. Now because of the beatings, my mum contemplated getting a priest in to bless the air raid siren in hope of putting an end to it. But my dad did some research, and according to where the air raid siren had been stationed back in the day and kept, no one had died near it to become attached to it. I never told my girlfriend at the time about the ghost girl because I knew she'd never come round. So one night, we'd curled up in my bed. It's a single bed. She's by the wall and I'm on the edge. And as I'm nearly falling off, I tell her to move over. Now stupid old me, I said the wrong girl's name. As I'm sure you can all understand, if your partner said the wrong name, you wouldn't be too happy. So she rolls over to have a go at me and immediately turns back around and starts sobbing into the bed, refusing to look back towards me. I get up, turn the light on and ask her why she's crying, still thinking it's because I said the wrong name. When she finally and slowly looked up, she was as pale as snow and was staring past me at the edge of the bed. This is when she told me that when she turned over towards me, there was a little girl in a white nightdress and long black hair standing directly behind me and staring down at her. I freaked the fuck out. After that night, I moved the air raid siren into the barn and immediately I could feel her presence gone from my room in the house. It was as if she couldn't get in. Whenever I go out into the barn, I can feel her there. Sometimes I see her standing near the siren. I can feel her outside my bedroom window now and again, but she can't get in and she can't hurt me. About three years ago, I went hiking in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Since I didn't speak Arabic and my phone didn't receive data in Morocco, I decided to hire a guide. He suggested that we hike Jebel Yagor. It was a smaller mountain, but I was told that it had an excellent view. About a quarter of the way up the mountain, I suddenly couldn't hear anything. I thought I was about to pass out and I sat down quickly. As I sat there, I realized I wasn't lightheaded. My vision was perfectly fine and I began to stand back up. I took a step forward, but I couldn't hear my foot hit the rocky ground beneath it. I took another step forward and then I once again could hear everything. I could hear my guide call out to me and ask if I was okay. I could hear the wind again and I could hear the voices of other people further up the mountain. I turned around and stepped back where I was standing a moment prior and again I heard nothing. I slammed my foot into the ground trying to make a sound but I still heard nothing. I picked up a small rock and threw it downward but still nothing. I eventually stepped forward again and called for my guide to come to me. I asked him to stand where I was a moment ago. He looked at me weird, but he stood there and I saw his eyes get wide. He took two steps forward very quickly and asked what just happened. 
I told him I hoped he know, but he'd had no idea. He seemed really spooked, even more so than me, and suggested we keep hiking. On the way up the mountain, we talked about how weird our experience was, and I decided to try to find the same spot on the way down. Once we reached the top and hiked back down, I tried standing in the same spot as earlier. The problem was that the spot looked like every other part of the mountain surrounding it. I spent about 30 minutes looking for the spot, but I couldn't find it. I know it's a long shot, but has anyone ever experienced something similar? Even better, has anyone experienced this on Jebel Yagor? When I was 23, my first husband and I purchased our very first home together. The year was 2013. We were newly married and decided it was time for a home of our own. By the time we settled on this one particular house, we had been on the market for a few months. Most places we had looked at were either located too far from work or family, so this house was centred close by to everyone and the commute to work was sure enough. So it was perfect. It was definitely a fixer-upper. It was built in the 60s, so because of its age and the amount of work it needed done on it, we got it for a really cheap price, around 60k, if I remember correctly. It was a two-story house with two bedrooms and bathrooms, with a full basement, two-car garage, and a beautiful sunroom. In the backyard was an underground pool with water so green it looked black. The whole yard was fenced in and extremely overgrown. The house sat on a very wooded and secluded plot of land. So wooded that even from the street you'd have a hard time spotting the house, unless you were really looking for it. The first six months went off without a hitch. I acclimated to the house and my surroundings pretty well. I can't remember exactly what started it, but after a while when I was home alone, things started happening. Small things. I'd get this strange and overwhelming feeling of being watched by someone or something. I would hear strange noises around the house, as if someone were walking around when I was the only one home. At first I just chose to ignore it, though most of the time, unfortunately for me, isn't the case. It was close to Christmas and I remember my husband at the time, we'll call him BB, and myself were out visiting with his family who had come into town for the holidays. That particular year, we had a terrible rainstorm, so bad it was like a monsoon. Because the weather was so bad, we decided to stay overnight with his family members at his aunt's house and make the journey back home the following day. When we arrived home the following day, we were grateful we didn't have any downed trees or damage to the house. Huge pine trees spanned the entire yard, front and back. Or so we thought. Our washing machine and dryer were located in the basement. I've never been a fan of basements ever since I was a little girl. So I usually had to haul the clothes hamper from our room upstairs down into the basement to do laundry. When I got down into our basement, it had completely flooded out from the rainstorm the night prior. Everything that was down there was completely destroyed. We instantly felt the pains of being the first time home buyers. In the following days, we contacted the home insurance company to make a claim. After work one afternoon, BB asked me to take photos of all the damage in the basement to send off to the insurance company. I was home alone and loathed going into that basement, especially when I was home alone. But I knew it needed to be done, so I grabbed my digital camera, put my big girl pants on, and made my descent down into the basement. When I reached the door, I expected to be met by water, but since a few days had passed, most of the water had been absorbed by the walls and excess had leaked out through the garage door and into the yard. There wasn't much light down there due to the basement not being wired correctly and the drop ceiling made it impossible to install any lights. So I opened up the door that led into the garage, used the only source of light from the basement bathroom and began snapping pictures of the basement. At first everything was fine but then I snapped a picture and what I saw absolutely baffled me entirely. In this particular photo, there appeared to be what looked like a long white ghost hooks falling from the ceiling. The kind of hooks they use in slaughterhouses to hang meat onto. 
I snapped a few more pictures to see if more would show up, but they didn't. But I was able to catch a few more light anomalies, like orbs, flying around in the photos, but nothing like the hooks from the first photo I took. I wish I still had these photos to show as proof, but unfortunately, so much time has passed they've been lost over the years. After a few more minutes of snapping photos, that same overwhelming feeling I mentioned before came rushing in on me. Except this time it wasn't just a feeling. Standing there alone in the basement in this big house with no one else around, I heard the distinct sound of a voice standing right next to me. I couldn't make out what it said or if it was male or female, but I knew I heard it. My eyes widened with fear as I scanned the basement. I could feel the heat rising in my cheeks as my heart started to pound out of my chest. Something was down in that basement with me and I was wanting no part of it. I instantly ran through the door that led into the two-car garage and called Bibi, frantically trying to get him what had just happened and what I had just captured on camera. Naturally, he played it down and shrugged it off. To him, it was all in my head and nothing more. Admittedly, I was frustrated and felt dismissed entirely. Fast forward about a week or two. By this time, I had all but forgotten about the basement incident. Life was back to normal and continued as usual, and I was getting ready for bed on this particular night. I was usually in bed way before BB. I would lay in bed watching TV, as I fell to sleep with the volume turned down really low, because I'm a light sleeper. The only real noise in the bedroom was from the fan blowing on to keep me cool. If you've ever been to Georgia, then you know how hot it can get in the summer months. Eventually I fell to sleep, but my peaceful slumber wouldn't last. I woke to that old familiar feeling of being paralysed and unable to move or speak. Except this time, I was seeing everything around me. My eyes scanned the room and at first I didn't see anything until my eyes shot to the foot of the bed where my feet were. Sitting there at the foot of my bed was a woman. I was instantly scared and didn't know what to do, so I just kept staring at her. She had long black hair that spanned down the length of her back. She was wearing what looked like a solid black kimono or dark monk robes. I couldn't see her face at first because of the way she was seated and positioned. Then after a moment or two, she began to move. She turned her head to look at me, and when she did, I noticed she had white bandages wrapped around where her eyes should be. The wraps appeared to be covered in a dark substance, almost like dried blood. She began crawling towards me, grunge style, and when she began doing this, for some reason, my reaction was to look away. She didn't like this at all and it did nothing to deter her. Not even a moment later I was face to face with this thing. When she reached for my face, I could feel her hair on my skin. Her mouth opened. It was circular and black and when I say she started trying to suck my soul out like a Dementor from Harry Potter, I literally mean I could feel this as it was happening. At first I was just letting it happen. It felt weirdly peaceful. I remember thinking to myself briefly, is this what dying feels like? And it's actually pretty peaceful. A few more seconds pass and it's like I snap out of whatever daze I'm in and realise I need to fight back or I may die. When I say I was instantly filled with rage and void of fear, I mean it was like a switch flipped. I was no longer scared of this thing and in fact I was extremely pissed off. I literally heard myself cussing this thing out and telling it to get off me. I was all fight and no flight. A few moments later, I was able to get myself out of it. My brain and body were once again on the same track. I sat up out of bed, my heart racing and Bibi was sound asleep next to me. My eyes darted and scanned the room to make sure nothing was there and that it was safe and of course, I didn't see anything there. This would be my second run in with sleep paralysis and my first experience with the Lady in Black. Towards the end of this two week period, I had another episode of Sleep Paralysis. This was the first time I'd experienced episodes so closely together. There was at least a year or two that separated my first two episodes. This one also happened as I was falling to sleep and not waking up. I remember on this particular night, I was having a really hard time getting comfortable and falling to sleep. 
I'm not certain how long I was tossing and turning for, but it had to have been for at least a few hours. I just remember at one point being aware that I felt like I was floating down, what I can only describe as a stream of soft silk. It flowed like water in a stream, but was so soft and didn't have a cool or warm sensation to it. I distinctly remember thinking to myself, this feels really nice. I'm just going to relax to see where this goes, because I've been struggling to fall asleep for so long. I was extremely naive to think this way, after what I had gone through previously. This relaxing and somewhat soothing experience quickly turned into something much more disturbing. As I began to indulge in the silky river and allow myself to drift off, I was met with the most evil and sinister sounding laugh you could possibly imagine coming from outside around me. Not in my head, but right next to me at my bedside in my bedroom. Though my body was paralysed, there wasn't a sensation of heaviness on my body like there had been before in previous episodes. And even though it was a struggle, I was able to fight to open my eyes enough to see around me. That usual intense fight or flight emotional response was more than apparent, and once again, I was all fight. I felt like whatever this thing was, was intentionally trying to scare me. Like, it was getting some kind of sick, twisted enjoyment out of tormenting me. I mustered all the strength I could in my neck to turn my head to the side of the bed, where this laughter was coming from. The challenge of struggling to open my eyes was just as difficult, but I was eventually able to get my sight positioned exactly where it would have been standing. But there was nothing there. I couldn't see anything at all. I'm not quite sure if most people would have the same responses to these things as I do, but I instantly got pissed off. I began to order my brain to snap out of it, and every muscle in my body to start moving. I wasn't about to try to force myself to go to sleep after this. After some time writing, I was able to finally force myself up and awake. I sat up straight in bed, right away looking around the room, my eyes darting to every nook, cranny and crevice. The room was dimly lit by a silent TV screen, the only noise coming from the ceiling fan above. My husband at the time was once again asleep soundly next to me, none the wiser to anything that had just happened. I didn't understand what was going on and I had no one to talk to about it. The few people I did decide to share it with usually didn't even know how to respond. Things only continued to ramp up after this. My energy levels started to greatly decrease. I was sleeping 12 to 16 hours a day, sometimes more. No matter how much or how little sleep I got, I would feel completely exhausted. Forcing myself up and scraping myself out of bed to even go to work was misery. At this point in time, I was going through a lot in my private life and I was extremely unhappy in a lot of areas. Depression from private life combined with confusion and frustration about all the things going on with me and around me that didn't make sense depleted my energy entirely. I can't recall how much time exactly had passed in between, but eventually I began to get woken up while sleeping, very regularly to my name being called. Sometimes it would sound male, other times like a female. There were times it sounded demonic or even robotic, but the voice never sounded the same each time it would happen. In the coming weeks that turned into months, I was spending a lot of time alone by myself. I would spend a lot of my time sitting at my PC in the computer room, usually playing video games and listening to music. On this particular day, I was sitting at my computer desk playing World of Warcraft with a friend of mine who lives in Texas. We'll call him CN. We were on voice chat through Discord, and we had just entered into a battleground, PvP arena. All of a sudden, my entire computer just shuts off completely, and so does the light in the room. I looked over at my husband at the time's computer desk, as it was close to mine, and his computer was still on and running like normal. At first I thought it was a simple power surge or a blip, since the house was quite old. Then I started to feel that weird type of energy start to build up in the room around me. That same kind of energy I felt all those years ago when I was 14 in Panama City Beach. The room started to feel really heavy, like there were too many people crowded into one room, even though I was home completely alone. I don't know why, but I began to feel extremely unsafe, and I told myself to just leave. I low-key started to panic and decided to call my friend back on mobile. 
I explained to him what was happening and asked him to stay on the phone with me while I got dressed to leave the house. My bedroom was located right next door to the computer room. As I walked out of the computer room and into my bedroom, it was like whatever it was, I could feel it following me. I grabbed a t-shirt and a pair of jeans from my closet and I told CN to hold on for a few seconds while I got dressed. I sat the phone on the bed and rushed as fast as I could to get dressed. As I'm almost finished and pulling my t-shirt over my head, I'm instantly frozen in fear. I hear someone standing next to me, whispering something incomprehensible into my ear. It was so low, I couldn't even make out if it was supposed to be a male or female voice. I paused for just a few seconds, still hiding within the safety of my cotton fed t-shirt, to see if it said something else, and it did. I pull my shirt over my head and look next to me, revealing nothing is there. I grab my phone and purse and tell CN I'm calling my grandfather to come pick me up. Unfortunately, my car had recently broken down, so I was unable to drive. My grandfather only lived about a 10 minute drive away from me, so thankfully it wouldn't take him long to get there. I sat on the steps of my front porch until my grandfather arrived. Even though I was about a 10 minute journey, his arrival seemed to take ages. As soon as his car came to a stop in the driveway, I jumped into the passenger side seat. I must have appeared a bit visibly shaken because the first thing he asked me if I was all right. I honestly didn't know what to say or how to begin to explain what was going on with me without sounding completely batshit crazy. For years I'd been experiencing odd things here and there since being a little girl, but nothing ever like this. Other than my sister and a few friends here and there over the years, I never spoke to anyone about these types of things. Most of the time it was because I didn't know how to, and honestly, I didn't want others to start judging me or thinking that I'm crazy, because it's the easiest thing to do in these kinds of circumstances. So just assume someone is crazy or mentally ill over these sorts of topics. Especially when you come from and live in the Bible Belt. When we arrived at my grandparents' house, my grandfather and I sat on his porch smoking a cigarette. We sat in silence for a few minutes. I was inwardly trying to decide if I was going to try to open up to him about some of the things going on with me or not. I thought to myself the worst that could come of it was that he would think I'm a complete fruit loop whose cheese had slid all the way off its cracker. Instead of laying it all out, I just asked him a few questions on the subject matter. I asked him if he ever experienced something he couldn't explain. Something that seemed odd and maybe even supernatural. My grandfather was a man's man. Very old school. When and if something upset him emotionally, you wouldn't know it. He never cried in front of anyone except my grandmother. And he wasn't easy to have emotional or even spiritual conversations with. I asked him if he had ever felt things or seen things he couldn't explain. He looked out into his front yard and took a long drag of his cigarette. Surprisingly, he nodded and said yes. I'm not sure if the shock was apparent on my face, but so many questions came flooding into my head. I was extremely curious. He continued on to say there have been a few times in his life that he's seen or felt something strange, but would deal with it by ignoring it. Unfortunately, my curiosity was short-lived and I decided to leave it there. I was at a crossroads and I knew I had two options. I could either choose to embrace what was going on with me and open myself up to it and possibly find some answers, or I could choose to keep trying to ignore it. Well, since trying to ignore it for so many years didn't seem to be working, I took it upon myself to open myself up to the possibility of something that seemed impossible. It was time to travel willingly down that rabbit hole. In September, my partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited and kept telling everyone I knew all about it. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work and of course, I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was. and When I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I've ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, 
she had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping and occasionally woke up to open cabinets or kitchen tools scattered around. Eventually, they started hearing what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying and crashes that sounded far off but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot and said they'd both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. The house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except some cheap costume jewellery. There was cash, valuable jewellery and designer clothing in the house, but it was all left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops, who said a neighbour had called about screaming and crying coming from the house, and had reported that they left their kids there alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant, and somehow ended up finding a trap door under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt. They found that it was the remnants of a very, very old root cellar. Apparently, one thing led to another in the search down there, and the police recovered some very, very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of their ASAP as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease and live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is in an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here. No scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this, but I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. Yesterday at 4am, I walked to someone down my road screaming, ah, then talking. This happened two or three times before I panicked and looked out my window. Saw this guy walking in the road screaming, then talking and screaming again. I lost sight of him and ran to get my mother. When we both got back to my room about 20 to 30 seconds later, we could still hear the same screaming. I would have written this off as a crackhead, just being a crackhead, but the odd part of the story is that the screams were distant. It's hard to explain the structure of my neighbourhood in text, but opposite my drive there's an entrance leading to a park. You walk forward then go to the left and forward again, and there's a large metal gate, always locked, which leads into tennis courts and a small field. This is 120 metres away from the road I saw him. When I got back to my room with my mother, the screams were distant, and the same sound. But they were distant not in the direction he was walking. My mother's hearing is not great, but she heard it twice before it stopped. It sounded like he was far away, and to get where it sounded like he was at, he would have had to run and climb a broken, locked and rattly gate. We heard nothing for two minutes. Some other called the police, and I gave a description of what I saw. Stayed up for the next hour, looking out, trying to hear anything. Unsure if the police did anything. My mother asked around with my neighbours, and no one heard anything. The ring doorbell didn't pick up anything. I checked out the route he would have had to take and gate locked. Nothing out of the ordinary. I'm just really dumbfounded at how the screams got so far away, in the span of 20 seconds. A bit of background. So I'm a 28 year old male who lives in BC, Canada. This experience happened when I was about nine years old. During the time, we used to live by a heritage site which was called the Pillith House. My family and pretty much the whole neighborhood used to refer this house as the creepy doll house every time we drove by or spoke of it. This experience had happened on a windy, somewhat rainy fall day. I was sick that day, so my mom made me stay home and not show up to school. At the time, it was only me and my mom at home. I had two older sisters that were in high school, and my dad was at work. My mum used to sew clothes for a living, and worked from home a couple days during the week. Right outside the rear sliding door that exits to the backyard, we built a small shed-like room area, where my mum could sew and store her sewing machine, and supplies, etc. 
She would be there a couple of hours a day and would check up on me when it was time for lunch. On this particular day, it was a normal sick day for me, just like every other sick day. I woke up, had some cereal, and turned on the TV and watched some Barney, while my mom was in the backyard sewing her clothes. The couch I was on was facing the TV, so my head was turned to the left. In front of me was a black glass fireplace with a reflection where my feet were facing. We also had a hallway that led up to the bedrooms, where my head was pointing at. As I was watching Barney, I noticed a dark figure with its knees bent, hunched over and swaying side to side, with its arms bent out on the reflection of my fireplace. The figure was dancing for a couple of seconds, until I turned around to look down the hallway, and nothing was there. It was almost as if it was mimicking what Barney was doing on TV. I wasn't frightened, because I thought it could have been one of my siblings home for lunch just screwing with me. I called out my siblings' names, but no one answered. I even ran down the hallway and checked out all the rooms, but again, no one was there. I ran out to get my mom and told her what happened, so we both came inside to look around, but the house was empty. But here's the strangest part. As we were coming out of the hallway, the front door slammed open, so I had to go downstairs and close and lock it. It was windy that day, but the door should have been locked. We didn't think much of it, and sort of just brushed it off. Fast forward more than 10 years later by this time, and we had already moved out. My sister came to visit me and my parents, and we were talking over lunch. My sister had recently learned that her friend's dad works for the government, and was assigned to take care and maintain the Pillith house. She only brought this up because the Pillith house again used to be right beside us. They would require him to stay a night so he could wake up and do yard work. Apparently, he had some frequent experiences in that house, such as random footsteps, knocking, but mostly someone jumping on his bed while he was trying to sleep. He was never bothered by it because it was so frequent. He mentioned that there was a spirit of a little boy and a man in that house. As she was telling us this, I immediately connected the dots. I'm pretty sure I met the little boy and it seemed like he just wanted to play. I remember the time it happened, I wasn't at all scared, but now I think about it, it was a bit creepy. My father's side of my family lived in Des Moines, Washington, in the late 60s to mid 80s. Through divorce and a house burned to ashes, my grandmother and non-blood grandfather moved into a house suitable to fit the 10 members of their family. Their children consisted of four girls and four boys, and almost all of the experiences were witnessed by the women of the family, which is very important to note. Everything started with an act of kindness. My aunt, we'll call her Jay, is the third oldest out of the siblings. After moving into the house, Aunt Jay did some exploring, as one would with new territory. She found an old cemetery with her younger sister Kay. Being the kind-hearted people they are, they spent a day clearing the overgrown grass and dirt covering the gravestones. The longer she stayed, she felt connected to the people, so she took time to read the names on the stones, hoping to keep their memory alive. Unfortunately, she made a terrible mistake. Shortly after the clearing of the cemetery, subtle but strange things began happening in their home. It started with the smell of roses, almost as if someone had brought fresh flowers from the market. The smell would be brief, would come at random moments like walking through the hall or while they sat and ate dinner. They couldn't explain it, but it was pleasant and they never mind. Soon, a noticeable stain appeared above the kitchen doorway. My grandmother, being a housewife, spent more than enough time trying to rid the stain, but no matter the cleaning method, it would never fade. The stain turned out to have much more significance than just a visual inconvenience. Around this time, two neighbouring boys were walking to school and came across a grisly sight. A young woman was found in a grassy roadside ditch, dead, covered in morning frost. The area had been seeing a lot of kidnappings and murders of young women at the time. This will be a key element later on in the story. As time passed, the occurrences became more frequent, more intense. The house has two stories. Most of the bedrooms were in the basement, which was slightly unfinished, leaving few lights and some doors without doorknobs. 
As you could imagine, it left an eerie feeling in a house already fueled with energy. At the time, the two oldest siblings, both boys, had moved out of the house, leaving six siblings behind. One of the first visual sightings belonged to my father. He witnessed a green mist flow through the empty hole where the doorknob would be. He would hear knocking at his door and shuffling of objects in his room. My dad was young at the time, so of course he moved into a room with his brother who was basically deaf and never personally experienced anything. I'm not sure of any more personal experiences he had because he wouldn't share them with me, nor would he acknowledge what he experienced. This explains why he wouldn't listen to me about the creature under my bed. Next was my Aunt S, and she might have had the most terrifying experience in the home. S was my grandfather's child. She was adopted during his first marriage as her mother had passed away from cancer. She had already experienced so much in her young life, which led her to be susceptible to the events. And one night, she woke up to the shaking of her bed, and what happened next would shake anyone to their core. She saw faces. Hundreds of ghoulish green and yellow faces covered her walls and ceiling. They were looking straight at her, mouths moving as if they were speaking. They didn't make a sound. After that night, she understandably moved into her sister Kay's room on the upper floor. Aunt L, who was also pretty young at the time, one noticeable occurrence she experienced was she could never hang anything up in her room as everything would fly or fall off the wall. One night, her mirror flew off the wall, shattering into a million pieces. Objects on dressers would fly across the room. She never got a restful night's sleep. In 2018, I discovered that Aunt Elle could hear the voices of those who passed. No matter where she goes, she always has experiences to this day. Now, back to the key member of the story, Aunt Jay. One night, all the siblings camped out on top of the easily accessible carport. As the kids were sleeping, their dog started to bark. Jay woke up and investigated the backyard. They had a shed not too far from the carport. A light pole sat right next to it. At the base of the pole, she saw a glowing silver of bluish light, about three feet long, standing vertically. The light slowly moved up the length of the light pole to the top of the tree line, where it stayed for at least five minutes. She told me she felt comfortable, almost as if it were a long-time friend. After some time, the light bent 90 degrees and quickly took off, fading into the night. Fast forward to her senior year of high school. As the school year was ending, she came down with a serious sickness that took her out of school for more than two weeks. One day, she needed to go to school later in the morning, which caused her to have to walk the most mile distance to her school. The neighbourhood was familiar to her, knowing almost every family in the area, so she walked comfortably to school. About halfway, an older and loud muscle car passed her slowly. It would turn around and make a couple of slow passes. As he passed her the last time, she heard a crystal clear voice of a woman in her ear saying, Run! And so she ran. Jay could hear the door open and footsteps trailing behind her. The school was surrounded by a green belt, so taking the road to the school would be a death sentence. But taking the shortcut through the green belt could save her life. As she ran through the dirt trails, she heard the voice again telling her to relax your arms. As she did when the man ripped her backpack off her shoulders. She ran as her life depended on it. As she made it to the edge of the school parking lot, she jumped over a log into the parking lot, just escaping his grip on her jacket. She ran into the school immediately, reporting it to the principal, but they never found the man. Jay believes, along with the rest of the family, that it was the man who murdered the young girl that was found in the ditch. Jay also believes that the sliver of light was the girl's spirit that truthfully saved her life. When enough became enough, my family spoke to the priests at the University of Washington, leading to an exorcism and blessing of the home. A medium came to the home and told them that a man and his wife lived on the property in a house that no longer stood. From an unfortunate event, the wife died and the husband died shortly after. 
the gravestones my aunt had read were those of the husband and wife. Turns out that the smell of roses was the wife. The priest spread holy water over the house, even on the stain over the kitchen doorway, which eventually disappeared. After that day, the energy seemed to die off and things began to feel as a house should. Their story ended up in the newspaper, all identities hidden, but their accounts had been recorded for the public to read and believe for themselves. Most of the family moved to Idaho, which led a new family to move into the home. They discovered later that the daughter had an imaginary female friend, but she wasn't imaginary at all. There's no updates on that family or their experiences. With my eight aunts and uncles, I have nine cousins. Seven of them are male and the other two are women. Remember how I said the experiences were mostly felt and witnessed by women? Well, my two cousins and I have had numerous experiences throughout our lives. My cousin T had an imaginary soldier friend. He would talk to her and tell her things a young girl would have no understanding about. My cousin Kay recently had a heartbreaking experience that revolved around a murder of a young girl in the Seattle area. She would see her everywhere she went, the grocery store, walks, within the hallways of the hospital she worked out. Turns out the young girl had been murdered by a family member and her murder hadn't been caught until recently. And as for me, my experiences started when I was seven with the terrifying experience of the doppelganger under my bed. In my early preteen years, I lived with my mom and brother in a newly built house. At this time, I had gotten an iPhone, the iPhone 4 to be exact. My friend stayed the night and she was obsessed with her looks, so she decided to take selfies on my phone. Upon looking at them, we discovered a face hovering over the fabric of the couch. When she had taken the pictures, it was dark and the TV was playing in the background, but it was bright and no light would reflect off the fabric of the couch. After finding one face, we discovered three more. The faces were absolutely evil looking. They were cloudy, but translucent. Yellow eyes and mouths open, exposing large teeth. My mother made me delete the photos, but I regret deleting such powerful evidence of the paranormal. Years passed without another profound experience, but I always felt the energy of certain places, always feeling uneasy and sad when I shouldn't. Fast forward to 2018. I went on a much needed family vacation to Seaside, Oregon. I was accompanied by two friends who wanted to explore the area. Close to Seaside is Astoria, which sits at the mouth of the Columbia River. The area is notorious for the dangerous ocean waters that has caused hundreds of shipwrecks in the early years of its settlement. We toured a historic Victorian manor, originally built by Captain Flavel. Although rich in history, the energy was non-existent, and we moved deeper into the town to get our fill of the history. We were directed to an old firehouse turned museum. There, we met an older gentleman by the name of Dr. D, who was a local college professor but did tours of the firehouse in the summer. Through curiosity and respect for the building, we quickly became trusted companions. He led us to the second floor, to a door that led to a stairway to the third story, which was the fireman's quarters. He explained that if the door was locked, we weren't invited, but if it was unlocked, we were welcomed in. The door was unlocked, so we made our way up the stairs. The railings and windows filled with dusty cobwebs, a path that didn't seem well traveled. Once we reached the top of the stairs, I began to feel like we were invading someone's space. We didn't belong. We turned around and headed back down the stairs to the second floor, where there were two rooms of exhibits. While crossing through a doorway into the other room, my friend quickly turned around, explaining that the lights had just flickered on and off numerous times. Once I stepped into the room, I was immediately stuck to one spot. I stood in front of a glass case sealing an old uniform, I couldn't move from that spot. I was overcome by sadness and despair, feeling the energy being drained out of me. As we stood there standing in front of the case, the light began flickering. Dr. D explained that those lights were all connected to one switch, so there was no reason for one case to flicker. Eventually, we were able to step outside. I sat on the curb, regaining my energy, but still stuck 
with a pit in my heart. To this day, I can still very clearly recall that feeling. 2018 was the year I moved from Idaho to Seattle. This is when the stories were passed down to me, and I eventually got the chance to see the Des Moines house. It still stands looking friendly on the outside, but the terrors of my family still resonate within its walls. From my experiences, I always wondered why I saw and felt things that others didn't. I soon discovered that the women in my family are sensitive to the spirit world, which only leads to more questions. I don't know what lies ahead of me, but I'm sure my experiences don't end there. So when I was 13, my older brother, 18, and I were on our way to a movie when we were hit by a drunk driver. I woke up in hospital four days later, having lost my right leg and other leg in a cast along with other injuries. That night, I woke up to my brother sitting by my bed, telling me everything will be okay and to go back to sleep. Next day, my parents came to visit and see how I was doing. I asked why my brother wasn't with them, and they looked at each other but didn't say anything. That night I again woke up to my brother sitting by my bed, again telling me he knows I can get through this, and I need to be strong and overcome this, and not let my injuries stop me from living my life. We talked a bit, him not answering specific questions, but answering more general questions. I remember asking him why he was still wearing clothes from yesterday, because that was very unlike him to wear anything similar to what he wore the day before. He didn't answer that, but when asked how he was, he said better than he thought he would be given the circumstances. He reminded me to be strong and keep living, and not let anything stop me, and how much he loves me, before telling me I should get some more sleep. The next day, my parents again came to visit me in the hospital, and I again asked why my brother wasn't with them, and they again looked at each other. And it was only after I said that I would like family visit together, not at different times. I would like my brother to visit during the day, when we can talk more, instead of at night. That my dad asked what I meant. And I told him Andy had been coming to visit at night. My mom broke down and left the room. My dad then told me that was impossible, because Andy died in the accident instantly. I didn't believe it, and argued about it, and ended up having to be sedated. That night I had no visit and the next day my parents brought a newspaper article about the incident. Years later, my fiance had an experience and having never seen a photo of my brother, she described him to a T on what he was wearing. That's a story for another time, but it was nice knowing my brother was still around and looking out for me and those I love. My brother died when I was 13, and we were both in a car accident. My fiancé never met my brother, never seen photos of him before this. My fiancé is bipolar, extreme highs and lows. We had been dating for four months at the time and just moved in together. I didn't know at the time, but she had gone off her meds. This all happened while I was at work, and she told me about it later. She went out for a walk to get some air, because she was feeling really claustrophobic the start of a manic slash depressive episode. It got to the point she thought dying would be the best option and standing at the corner, she thought the best idea would be to just walk into traffic. As she took a step off the curb, someone grabbed her and pulled her back and turned her around into a hug. Arms wrapped around her, telling her she doesn't truly want to do this, that everything will be okay and that she's stronger than she realises and it isn't her time. Told her to just breathe nice, slow, deep breaths. She looked up at him and said thanks. Turned around to wipe her eyes, and when she turned back, the person was gone. She told me about this when I got off work, and she wanted to put up a post online to see if she could find the guy, to say a proper thank you for his help in saving her. It was when she started saying what he told her and describing him, that my heart started beating fast. I knew who helped her. She described him as being athletic, 17 to 18, 
slightly taller than her, dark brown shaggy hair, a big freckle slash birthmark under his eye with a blue shirt that said JS. Denk's in a yellow letters. It brought me back to the visits I got in the hospital. The shirt my brother wore on the day of the accident and when I saw him by my hospital bed. I told her I know who helped her and I can't explain it. I told her it was my brother and she said it was impossible. It was a real person. She got mad at me for suggesting it because she never believed in ghosts or spirits or anything like that. Very sceptical. I asked her to please trust me. And that night, we drove to my parents' house. And I went into the basement and found a picture of my brother. And asked if that was who helped her. And her face went pale. And kept asking how it was possible. I had no idea what to say. Because I didn't know either. But told her how he came to me in my time of need. And looks like he came to her in her time of need. Still crazy to think about. And definitely can't explain. A bit of background before we get to the story. For as long as I can remember, I've experienced strange things. Usually, it's just hearing voices calling me, or seeing various entities, etc. This particular story is more of a series of events that led to a conclusion. As a kid, there was one incident where I was walking home from the neighbourhood pool with my brother, and a couple cousins. I reached the crossing a minute or two before them, and decided not to wait for them. I looked both ways multiple times, and not seeing any cars, I started crossing the road to the next crossing, and my brother started yelling at me to stop. I turned to look back at him, and he asked why I didn't stop at the intersection. When I told him that I did and looked several times before walking, he told me that there was no way that I could have stopped, because they weren't that far behind me. And if I did stop, I would have seen that it wasn't safe to cross. I argued back that it was safe to cross when I started crossing, and he looked me dead in the eyes and said, if that car hadn't stopped, you'd be dead. And that's when it dawned on me to look around again. There was a black sedan with tinted windows sitting just inches away from me. I hadn't seen or heard it drive up. So between the ages of 8 and 17, I almost drowned several times. The last time was probably the scariest. I was at a youth camp with a friend's youth group, and we had gone for a swim in the lake during free time. So a group of us decided to swim up to a boat to go jet skiing. It wasn't a very long swim, maybe about a couple hundred feet or so. So I wanted to ride in a jet ski in an environment where it wasn't storming. Halfway there, for whatever reason, I decided to turn back. I swam back, and once I reached a spot where I knew I could stand, I stopped. But as my right foot touched the bottom of the lake, a hand grabbed my right ankle and pulled me under. It was gripping me so tightly I could feel the claws digging into my skin. I struggled and called for help until I heard a voice say, Stop struggling, no one's coming. And I felt myself go limp and be pulled further under the water. Right as I was beginning to lose consciousness, I was pulled up by a girl I had just met. She helped me, back to the dock where I coughed up a lot of water and cried for a bit. It'll be five years this summer and to this day, I can still feel the hand gripping onto my uncle with the force to crush it. After I got my license, I spent a lot of time with friends when I could. The first time anything weird happened while I was driving, I was out with a friend and we'd run a few errands for her mom before going to pick up her cousin. We stopped at an intersection and the light had just turned red. As we sat there, I watched the light change from red to green, and so I accelerated, thinking that it was a standard green light. But it almost felt heavy, if that makes sense. I describe it as a feeling kind of like I was in a trance. My friend started yelling, what are you doing? Stop! And I snapped out of whatever state I was in, and realised that we were seconds away from being T-boned and possibly killed by a massive white van. I moved back into my original spot, and I kept trying to tell my friend that the lights had been green, but she didn't believe me. After that, I started getting into accidents. Mostly just minor things, like accidental bumper taps. The second of the three I was in, which was the most major, I was driving to a job interview, and my vision went white. 
It was almost like someone put a white cloth over my head and by the time I could see again, I was ploughed into the back of another SUV. About six months to a year after that, my parents took me to see a therapist because they were worried that I might have been suicidal. The therapist asked general questions about my behaviour, leading up to not only seeing her, but also to some of the events. I was honest with her, and then she asked me if I've ever heard of a death wish. I admitted that I hadn't, and she told me that she figured I had one. I'm still not sure what to think. I haven't had any more accidents, but it can be argued that I've simply just found a car more suited to me instead of a death wish. However, I've been able to find a lot about it. But if you guys have any ideas on what could have been happening, let me know. In the middle of the night, I feel like I've woken up. And above me on the bed is a humanoid figure made of shadows. And I have the impression that its hands are around my throat. Although I'm not experiencing any, any trouble breathing. And I cannot move. And I remembered from all the posts that I had read yesterday that I'm supposed to be stronger than anything that comes at a person while they're in sleep paralysis. So I fight the paralysis and I have a bite guard in my mouth because I clench my teeth at night. And I start trying to force the words go away out of my mouth and move my arm to wake up my fiance. And eventually I'm able to force the words out after a lot of shitty mumble attempts and get my arm to touch my guy. And after I say go away, it does. And the sun comes up and my guy wakes up in my dream and is like admiring the way the sunlight hits my face. And I sleep with blackout curtains, so this part is definitely fiction. And then I actually wake up. The weird thing is that I didn't have a lot of feelings of serious lingering fear. I mostly feel loved, but I'm still half asleep but like a safe half asleep and I go away out loud for real this time. And then I rolled over to snuggle with my guy, even though it was too warm and fell back asleep. Now until yesterday, I didn't know anything about shadow people specifically. But when I was a sophomore in high school, I would go on walks with my dog to the local park at night. Night is a stretch. I live in Minnesota, so it was like going at six, but it was dark. And I always had the impression of shadows being where they didn't belong and watching me. And that sensation of movement at the corners of my eyes. And when I got home, I'd find new bruises on my arms and legs. At the time, I had just read the book Teether. So I convinced myself it was a creature. So I stopped going out at night, but I had a lot of trouble sleeping at night because I just felt like I was being watched. It was that feeling you had when you were a child where you're too scared to open your eyes for fear of what was in your room at night. But as a high schooler, everyone told me I was imagining it. And I was like, I mean, like, I know, but it means my mind is a horrible place to be. Years later, I was diagnosed as bipolar and I just chalked up to that. But it should be noted that I'm type two bipolar. And since then, I've had no hallucinations. I would just get really depressed, or when I was manic, I would just get really artistically productive, then a little slotty and bubblier, and I'd spend all of my money on stupid shit. Anyways, I just wanted to get some feedback on whether or not it was just an odd dream, especially because it seems like shadow people are mostly just kind of watchers from the posts I've read. I don't have a lot of memories from my past. I've undergone a lot of trauma in my childhood that I've blocked out. Yet this one memory is something so vivid and clear, I can detail what we saw that night. It all happened in my backyard. My parents had a big bonfire for the neighborhood back then, almost once a week. But they soon got a tiny fire pit closer to the house for just our personal family time. My best friend was always invited since she was always around. I was around seven going into eighth grade, and we had just gotten the smaller pit. My mom, dad, sister, nephew, and best friend were roasting marshmallows and just enjoying the night, talking and laughing and just having fun. 
All of a sudden, a very white figure appeared in the corner of my eye. On instinct, my head turned to look at whatever was out of place in the dark night. My heart raced like it never had before, and my eyes went really wide. Breathing picking up as what I saw was a white saber-toothed tiger. It had the black stripes accompanying its white fur. It saw me, and I saw it. But when I blinked, it calmly walked behind my neighbour's dog fence and disappeared. I went to turn away, as I'm used to seeing these things, but usually alone. I was afraid my whole life until that point I was crazy. That I was seeing things. But when my head turned so I could go back to my family, my eyes met my best friends. Her eyes were way more frightened than mine, and she whispered to me, Did you see that? To which I was honestly stunned and replied yes. She was terrified, more so than I. And that's when my mum asked what we were talking about. So before I could answer, she responded with exactly my own description. I knew I wasn't just seeing things, and she'd only asked if I saw what she saw. My mum told us we were seeing things. No one else saw the white mass we did. They just saw darkness. We still talk about whatever it was, and she's still terrified to talk about it. Back in 2013, I was moving from Florida to Kentucky for a new job with a close friend I grew up with. It's about a 15 hour drive, so we decided to leave around 6 p.m. and drive straight through to get to Kentucky the next morning. The route takes you through Atlanta and then a long, dark stretch of mountains in Tennessee where there are no exits, no cell service, and it's very steep. It's about an hour long drive where there are signs everywhere that say, no jake break and no breaking downhill when you're in the mountains. While driving it feels very dangerous, going downhill, and this was in November and the roads were very slick at night. It was about 3am. I was driving and my friend was in the passenger seat sleeping. We were coming down one of the mountains and up ahead I saw a bright light that was slowly getting bigger as I approached. I realise what I'm seeing is a car fully engulfed in flames in the left lane at the bottom of the hill. I yelled to my friend to wake up so we could figure out what the hell to do. Obviously if anyone wasn't in the car, they could not have survived and we were not equipped to help. It also seemed like a dangerous idea to stop the car because it was at the bottom of the mountain and we were worried we'd be in danger from oncoming cars so late at night. I mean, the car was on fire and I barely saw it until I was close up to it. As we're trying to figure out what to do, we realise neither of us have cell service, but we see a sign for a gas station two miles up the road. We get to the gas station and tell the guy working there about what happened. He tells us, unfortunately, that this is something that happens from time to time, and that he would call a state trooper for us, so that we could tell him exactly what happened and give any information we could. Less than 10 minutes later, the trooper pulls up and we tell him exactly what happened. But he's confused, because he says to get to the gas station to meet us, he was driving the same direction we were driving. And there was no other exits for 15 miles. And it would have been impossible for him to miss a flaming car. After a few minutes of us basically arguing with him about what we saw, and assuring him we weren't on any drugs and had not been drinking, we travel south with him, following us to the location of the accident. And sure enough, there is no burning car there. No car at all. To this day, me and my friend are sure of what we saw. We passed within maybe 10 feet from the car itself, one lane owner. We clearly saw a car burning. But apparently, it never happened. Three months ago, I saw a black figure hiding around the corner. As I ran after it, it seemed to get further and further away. After going to security and seeing nothing was there, I figured maybe it was something in my head. About a month after I saw this figure, I started getting weird gut feelings. It's almost hard to describe, but it's kind of like a sick to your stomach feeling at the worst, and others, it feels like something is off. Like the feeling you forgot your phone when you're leaving home and don't realise it yet. What I realised over time though, was when I got those feelings from my friends, 
family, and most recently, even I was in danger and was in a dark spot. The first account out of the many I have had with a friend was he was in a dark spot. I got that uneasy feeling in my gut and I had the merge, urge to message him and ask if he was okay. That was when he was told me he was going through some dark stuff and wasn't sure who to talk to or where to go. He said if not for me messaging him, he might have done something bad. The most recent one that happened to was to me. A few days before I went out to my friend's place, a whole three hour drive away, my stomach was in the worst twist possible throughout that Monday night. I kept seeing the black figure around my area and was always watching me from afar. Everything went fine going up, usual traffic being hectic in the big cities with all the riots. Everything went fine, no riots that night, no fights, but the next day it started raining hard. Long story short, I hydroplane off the freeway. Luckily everything was fine and I walked off with a messed up shoulder and headaches. My name's Marco, and I live in the south of Italy, in Sicily. I've been a paranormal enthusiast from when I was six years old. Although I had some strange experiences in the past, I always try to think rationally, and I always try to give possible explanations to those happenings. And I can confirm to you that I keep this approach still to this day. But recently, some particular occurrence has left me scratching my head. Not quite terrified, but just confused. Two or three weeks ago, I was in my house. I had just finished studying for my graduation exam that would have taken place the day after, and I decided to just relax a little bit and just sit in front of my porch, enjoying the nighttime fresh air. As you can imagine, at that moment, I was basically riding a roller coaster of emotions. I was pulling out of the pockets of my headphones when suddenly a noise caught my attention. It was a radio like noise. The noise that you might hear when your radio is trying to connect to a station that's far or just hard to connect with. I had no idea from where that sound could have been produced. It appeared to be not that far from me, and I live in a countryside neighbourhood in which nobody would ever think to use a radio in that hour of the night. It was strange, but in the end I had other things to think about, and I blamed that on the suggestion. Some days earlier, I read about Siren Head and the other creations of Trevor Henderson, so it had to be just a suggestion, right? Well, a week ago, another one of these happenings made me doubt that. I was again sitting on the porch, but not the same. I actually have two porches, and while the first faces the gateway of my house, the other one faces my garden and some trees that I have. Again, I was enjoying the freshness of the Sicilian night, but this time, I was also with my girlfriend. Like the other day, I was in a great state of emotion. I won't say why, but you can imagine. While we were there, it happened again. I heard that same sound, but much, much closer. Almost coming from a tree that was at least five meters away from us. I also can almost certainly tell you that this other occurrence happened almost at the same time as the one before. But one of the details stood out the most for me. This time, mixed with the radio buzzing, it seemed like there was some disembodied voice that spoke God knows what. The voice also seemed to be from a radio. Curiously, my girlfriend told me that she heard something, but it was very different from what I heard. Some sort of mix between a growl and the sounds of bushes when the wind blows. I'm not claiming that we're talking about a siren head sighting. It would be silly, since the creature is just the creation of an illustrator. But then, why did I hear that noise? And why did I hear it in two precise moments in which I felt strong emotions? This is weird, but I'm not actually scared. And I just wanted to share with you my experience, hoping to find somebody with some experience like the one that I had. Or just somebody who can give me an explanation. <laughs> 